بكت عيني بكت عيني بكت عيني على ذنبي وما لاقيت من كربي فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب Assalamu alaikum and welcome to a very special episode of the Sultans and Sneakers podcast. I'm your host, as always, Mahin the Podcaster. And today we have a very special panel for an important discussion on political engagement. My guests are three leaders in our community who really need no formal introduction. But I am here joined by Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi, Dr. Shadi El Masri, and civil rights attorney Hassan Shibli. Uh, Salam alaikum, brothers. Uh, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show today. So, um, this pot, this idea for this podcast of political engagement, um, the idea came about about a month ago. Shake Yasser, that was you were in Chicago, was that roughly four weeks or something around that time? Seems like, yeah, I mean, a few weeks ago, we're as usual, uh, uh we, we hit each other up in terms of the burgers of Chicago, One right? Of weaknesses. Had that weakness, bro. Inshallah, I, I love my burgers and steaks in Chicago, so we were just discussing, and uh, I don't know why, with the top. It came up, obviously, political engagement. And I said, you know what? We need to really have a frank conversation and dialogue with people of diverse backgrounds so that we can understand the spectrum of uh, 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 nuance here and to understand why people feel the way that they do. And, uh, you know, Mahin, I know that you had a podcast. So one thing led to another. And uh, alhamdulillah, here we are. <laughs> alhamdulillah. So um, what let me ask you, Sheikh Yasser, to start off, like wh what's it, it, what's driving your intent here to have the conversation? Is is it like I, I know right now you are? It's been a couple of years. P people, have, I, you're not new to taking criticism, right? Whether it was in your more like fresh Medina days, you know, versus even today for different things. Um, is there something specifically that happened recently that that kind of triggered this idea, or are we are you just seeing, uh, you know, the atmosphere in America that we're just split over political and political issues and maybe we shouldn't have been what, like what, what's kind of driving this thought uh i mean it's not any one particular incident or stuff but i think that for a number of of years now um the american muslim community is long overdue a frank dialogue between the activists on one side and the religious leaders on the other uh and then the muslim masses in the middle who are kind of sort of really really just looking at this this debate taking place or this harshness or even sometimes not even talking past each other, sometimes not even talking with each other. I think it's high time that we have a frank conversation about what's going on, why is there so much tension, uh, why is there so many differences of opinion, even amongst the du'as, even amongst forget. Obviously, the activists, generally speaking, they are following one spectrum, understandably. But even amongst the scholarly class, even amongst the preachers uh, of Islam, uh, there is, at times some type of harsh debate and rhetoric taking place online about the best way forward, about what exactly our visions and goals are. And this one podcast is not going to solve the issue, but I hope, inshallah, it's a beginning, and I hope, inshallah, it'll be leading to future conversations with other people as well. Sure. So so I think when people are seeing the landscape, the lay Muslim, the laity, and, and I think we're the audience here, as I see it, are people on the more practicing spectrum, right? People who ca who care about Islam as a paradigm of life as their worldview. They're not looking at Islam as a cultural identity first and foremost. It's essentially about salvation and theology, right? Even in that group, you're finding splits, right? If, would that's you what I'm talking about, yes. That's, yes, what, yes, talk yes. that's what we're talking about, right? Just yes. just to lay it out there. Um, and then you have various perspectives. You, you have, I think I think the perspective that you, you're, you're willing to listen to politicians and their, at least their takes, hear them out a little bit, and then think maybe there's some gray area, maybe there's some things we can, we understand there are problems with some of their platforms, but at the same time, we have issues in our community that may need political engagement, need representation, et cetera. Am I, am I hearing you right? Is that, would you characterize your thought process that way? No, I wouldn't. I'll, the reason being, um, I actually personally yeah. don't get involved in politics directly. Okay. I have never supported a candidate. I've never canvassed for a candidate. I've never raised funds for a candidate uh, in office. Um, the you know politicians in office. 
I've never, you know, said to my Muslim community, go vote for X rather than Y. My main concern isn't personally actually a politician himself or herself. Okay. My main concern is the division within the Muslim community. My main concern is that religious folks are developing a sense of, of, of uh, rhetoric against other religious folks, mistrust, distrust, dismissal of the other worldview. My mm -hmm. main concern is that that little pocket of religious Muslims and to make us understand that, you know what, even us religious folks are not the only piece in the entire puzzle. In fact, we're the smaller piece in the larger puzzle. And there's other pieces of the puzzle, even other Muslims, like you you, you call civilizational Muslims, if I got the term correctly. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to use that term, but the bulk of the American Muslim community, the majority of them are not on our wavelength and paradigm in this particular discussion. Even if we don't agree with them, we cannot just dismiss their existence. We cannot just ignore that that is the default of the American Muslim community. How do we engage with them? in a wise manner without alienating them? What is the best way forward? So my main concern isn't the actual politician, believe it or not. It's right. actually the internal dialogue taking place in our own Muslim community. Mm. And especially priori priority for me is the religious community because I find all too often that our own religious folks are not even taking a step back and hearing the other side, the other religious folks and allowing for there to be a excuse me, a spectrum of interpretation where the Sharia allows for that spectrum of interpretation. I got gotcha. you. So I, I I hear your pain point then. So Dr. Dr. Shadi, um, I don't know if you, is that where you're coming from as well, or you see you you've told me off the record that your position is pretty fairly straightforward and simple, right? When it comes to you know, but when we're talking about I guess now the community at large and this, I think. As the religious folks, it's part of dealing with our greater community who may not be as practicing, may feel needs to get involved, et cetera, in these in these movements. Um, what's your general take on this approach? I as like people know you as a as a as a community guy, and that you you work on your community and that's your sphere of influence, and you do what you can control, right? Yeah. So uh, what Sheikh Yasser just talked about is more like a double khilaf. Okay. Like the manners of how people interact and how Du'at amongst themselves interact. Right. And I think we were like two, two, three years ago, Sheikh Yasser and I were, were in a part of a panel where there must have been like 20 or 30 imams, right? All like who are, have national agendas uh, there in Boston. And that was a wonderful weekend. We all camped out. It wasn't mm -hmm. really, it was sort of a semi camp, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't a fancy hotel. It was like out somewhere. Okay. Uh, and 20, 30 of us having breakfast, having lunch, praying a lot, and then having these discussions. It was, we were on such a good track. Then it sort of derailed and later on it blew up. Right. Uh, and, 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 and as time passed, we never got there again. So I, what Sheikh Yasser just said, I think that what I hearing from that is it's more about the adab of khilaf more so than the issue itself. And he could correct me if I'm wrong about that. The, the Adab al-Khilaf as a precursor to yeah. the issue. Eventually, we'll also get to the issue, but we're not going to be able to get to the issue when yeah. everybody is takfeeding him to the everybody, everybody else, when everybody's refusing to acknowledge that mm. other people in the room are knowledgeable and sincere and have a perspective of where they're coming from, right? Even if I disagree vehemently, they're not coming out of a place of a vacuum. And the world is not monochromatic or dichromatic. The world is very complex. And the irony of ironies, I don't actually have a particular position per se. I'm trying to teach the usul. I'm trying to teach the overall paradigm. I don't actually vote. And I've never voted for a candidate. I've never endorsed a candidate. But what pains me is that, you know, there can be correct, uh, good Muslims, not correct, there can be good Muslims, and even the correct methodology or ideology when it comes to politics is not black and white. Sometimes there are potentially correct positions on both sides, you know. Well, I liked what uh, uh, not to. I liked what Dr. Hatton once said, and I think it was in an interview I did with him. He said there are certain things that's clear cut kufr, and there are certain things that would make a person outside Ahl Sunnah. Then there are things that would not put you outside Ahl Sunnah, but you may believe that it's a gravely misguided error. Mm. And so well, there are rules to deal with zanadiqa, zindiq. He says he's a Muslim, but his belief is far from that. A mubtada, 
heretics and innovators. There's a law on how to interact with them. There's also a law that applies to somebody who you vehemently disagree with on a point. And that third category, all the rules of brotherhood still apply, right? All of the husna done still applies. And there's no cutting off, right? There may be you just differ on that point and you could be as vehement as you want. So I think when it comes to the precursor to how to discuss this, we got to realize what is it that puts you totally out of the deen? What is it that puts you in some kind of realm of bid'ah that we're not going to talk to you anymore, right? And what is it that we could we would just ve- disagree at uh, vehemently or not vehemently, where the rules of brotherhood still apply, and we don't say that this person is khalas like you associate with him it's danger and you don't salam him, etc. So I think the problem that we may have, and, and I w- I agree where we witnessing the same problem. These rules are all mixed up. Someone on an issue that you could disagree is treating it like kufr, right? That's where the problem is. And by the way, I hate to bring this up all the time because it's become cliched, but subhanAllah, in this case, it is totally true. The khawarij. I'm sorry to bring this up because it's really, every time you bring up the term khawarij, everybody gets, you know, sensitive. Mm-hmm. But in this case, wallahi, it's 100% true. What makes the early fitna between the sahaba and the khawarijah is different? Muawiyah on the one hand, uh, Ali on the other hand, عن, Ibn Abbas on a third platform, عنهم, جميعاً, and the Kharijites. What makes them all different? Well, the Sahaba vehemently disagreed to the point of literally unsheathing the sword and going to war with one another. But they didn't make tabdir. They didn't bring in that this person's a kafir or mubtadir or zindir or dal or whatever. The Kharijites took political positions and made a religion out of it. The Kharijites said, if you support so-and-so, you're a kafir, you're a dal and mubin, right? And sorry to say here, and again, people hate it because it has become a bit cliche that I do understand, but we're seeing a similar type of misunderstanding when it comes to political affiliations, political loyalties, right? That you can decide in their time frame that Muawiyah is the best politician, even though your heart might be more in line with Ali radiallahu anhu and whatever, for whatever reason. And you can strongly disagree with that sahabi or that tabi'i who does so but it doesn't make him a mubtadir or a or mudin. And it requires ilm and, and wisdom and a lot of knowledge to understand the nuances. Unfortunately, what we do have is this simplistic black and white, which is what the Kharijites did really, that you either, you know, in al hukm illa lillah, everything has to be judged by their version of the Quran. And if you don't, then you automatically become a kafir. But the world doesn't work in that monochromatic understanding. And if you think it does, then you are heading down this path of extreme vitriolic, you know, uh, tabdi'ah and danger. But anyway, uh, that's my two cents for the even, even Ibn Abbas, Sayyidina Ibn Abbas said that atqahum Abu Bakr wa Umar wa asyasuhum Muawiyah. Like yep, exactly. The, exactly. the most pious was Abu Bakr Umar. The best political maneuver was Muawiyah. Even he said it, and he's Ibn Abbas. Even though he didn't join Muawiyah's rank. Yeah. You know, okay. So Dr. Shah, you, you, you mentioned there was three categories of khilaf, right? Is that, is that right? Yes. Okay. So let's get into a case, maybe not to mention names, but like recently, let's say you have a Muslim politician who mm-hmm. has certain problematic views, let's say on, I don't know, some social liberal issue. Okay. You know, everyone, I don't have to like spell it out. I think but everyone can imagine about. what you're referencing right now. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they get invited to say, said mainstream conference, Right. And this is a conference that's generally a conservative audience. So this person, I don't know if they got a, they, they were platformed and they got to sp- spend and they are now setting as an example to our um, children and, and, and youth coming up, right? Um, this person po- may issues views that could be like haram, straight up. Right, the or even could be pushed in stuff that could be borderline kofar. Right, right. and you, you just go ahead and spit it out, bro. You're just like yeah. you're setting it up in these vague terminologies. <laughs> I don't know, guys. Do you really want to keep it this vague and everybody knows? Or I don't know. It's look, <laughs> look, if someone does something publicly, there's no shame. There's no backbiting in talking <laughs> about it. Right. Okay. So there's so no so, we're, so we're talking we're talking about Congresswoman Ilhan and Ikna, right? Yes. Um, you know, and so she's an Ikna, and then there's Pride Month, and there's the whole dancing at the parades and stuff, right? Dr. Shadi, I mean, you, you, you were you were pretty upfront about her stance on on. We were at it. She's on Twitter. We yeah. discussed it on the Mad Mum Luke's, like what is it, like a month ago or around that time, right? Um, 
where people, the idea of a scholar supporting her or saying that we need to like at least support her because she represents us and the community doesn't um, care about her social baggage and all that stuff. And, you know, she helps. She's the only voice we have for issues of Uyghurs or Israel or BJP, etc. Whatever it is, um, which key left does that fall under? Not with her, but with a, with a scholar or somebody of knowledge who may say that, hey, w w we need to back her. I don't think that uh, like uh, some of her, some of those actions uh, would fall under the category of a difference of opinion. Some of it is blatantly supporting what is forbidden. Right. right. Yep. And uh, so we we don't increase the sawad. Man kathara sawad qawman fahuwa minhum. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, and the ulama took took from that. And also, la'an Allahu man awa muhdithan. So uh, the curse of Allah who's, who who gives refuge to a muhdith, a, who is like either an innovator or a ref, uh, some someone running away from the law. So or someone who's causing fitan. So point being is the ulama have set us some parameters on who we can put up on a platform, right? Takthir is sawad. Putting the takthir is sawad means you're increasing their followership. You're increasing people, giving them attention, right? So I feel much more comfortable with the position that you don't give a platform or you don't give attention to, or you don't draw attention to, or put up as an authority, okay? Somebody who is gonna do those types of things, right? Um, dancing. In, has got to indicate some approval going to certain events and parades it indicates some degree of approval right you don't just show up at a parade by accident and start dancing like you premeditated that you did it then people criticize you you stood by Fine, do what you want allah tells if i don't have them come out to the internet you'll see the result do what you want you all see the results so i'm not here to tell people what to do in their own lives right but I love the position. I feel safe with the position that, and by the way, most of the ulama will also agree. We don't put someone on a platform that we would not hold them up as an example. Their actions, their public actions contradict the Sharia and they stick by it, right? I personally wouldn't, I would even be even more specific. I wouldn't put someone up that I wouldn't want my kids to be like, right? Put them up. If, I'm, if I run a platform, I wouldn't put someone, that's like the type of hypocrisy, right? So you want other people to be guided by this person, but not, so that's the position that I take on that. And it's mm -hmm. not even my position. I've, that's what I've been, what I've learned. I'm not someone much that makes up these rules. Okay. I, I, I want to ask, uh, Hassan hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Hassan is someone I think has, you have a lot of underground reality and background and mm -hmm. dealing with like civil rights and for Muslims, etc. Um knowing her positions and hypothetically speaking, let's say she could help us, you know, really advance civil rights for Muslims. And you, you know, the reality on the ground more than any of us. Um, you know, is there a case still you think that, Hey, there's still a benefit here. Or do you think it's really like a perceived benefit? And we don't really have actual practice. We don't have really tangible results from that kind of representation. It's not worth it. Like, what do you think? Bismillah. I think we're making it two zero sum, to be honest. So okay. look, from my perspective, and just to start, because we st spoke generally and then we got into the specifics. So on a general perspective, my, my concern is the fact that there are many activists uh, that use their activism as a tool to tear others down. So if you're not liberal enough, they'll tear you down. If you're not conservative enough, they'll take you they'll tear you down, even if you're within their activist circle. Unfortunately, we're starting to see that even within the popular online uh, Muslim scholarship class as well. You know, Islam um, becomes a means of tearing people down. And and I and, and again, I'm not thinking of any particular examples, but as a general thing, I think we always have to question ourselves, what do we love within our hearts? Do we love to tear people down? Do we love to bring people together? Do we love for our faith to succeed? Uh, what is our motivation? I think a lot of times we're, we're missing the sincerity in how we engage with each other. So I think it's important to discuss the, the ikhtilaf issue and the adabul ikhtilaf. Now, the second issue I want to discuss is that there are for many people, their activism is their religion. 
In other words, their primary goal is activism. It's the cool thing to do. It's the hip thing to do. And then they want to twist Islam to justify and support it and, 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 and aid it. And I've seen them take that to too far extremes, unfortunately. Whereas really our job, regardless of where we're coming in from, is that really our primary motivation is our deen, is pleasing Allah you know, is, is being ready for when we're put under six feet of earth. And then our activism is an extension and a tool of that. And therefore it will stick within the confines of the Sharia. That's essential. And this is something we've learned from all of the, the, the scholars and the speakers here and, 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 and elsewhere. Now to get into the third and specific point, look, um, we have to first understand that it's a learning process. So on the ground, we're constantly fighting to get Muslims that are wrongfully targeted by the FBI off the terrorist watch list. On the ground, we're struggling to get people who've been in jail for years unjustly out of jail. It is a difficult fight. We're constantly targeted by the Islamophobes. We say one word, we may destroy our dunya. We say another wrong word, we may destroy our akhirah. We're constantly under tremendous heat, tremendous pressure. We're under-resourced and outgunned, so to, so to speak, politically and legally. And we're, we're seeing the victims of anti-Muslim politics. We're seeing the victims of anti-Muslim laws. So we're driven, I think, those of us that are sincere by a sincere passion to, to liberate those that are wrongfully uh, incarcerated, harassed while they travel, facing hate crimes. That's what we're driven by. Now, at the same time, I will say, and the longer I've been in the uh, spheres of activism, I genuinely believe that modern extreme secularism and even its its forms of, of extreme feminism that is extremely toxic and distorted in our time, uh, and the support for ways of life that are antithetical to all the prophetic traditions, and the confusion as to what even a man and a woman is. That whole mindset and ideology, I believe, is one of the biggest threats that society is facing. It's literally, I've seen it destroy families. I've seen it take people down the road to kufr. So I understand the psychological and theological uh, detriment that some of the uh, secular extreme ways of thinking can lead to. At the same time, we need to be able to help people that are on the ground that are suffering. And unfortunately, I think over the last decade or two, it, it has tended to be the liberals that are more supportive on many issues of Muslim civil rights, but that's also not the case. I mean, some of the biggest Islamophobes are also extreme liberals like Bill Maher. And I think our loyalty as Muslims, first of all, it needs to be to neither party. You know, I do believe in voting. I do believe in supporting candidates. And, and I believe we have to analyze each and every one, but we should not appear to belong to one party or another. And I think the Muslims have made a tremendous mistake in appearing to align with one party or one political ideology. And that has led to our detriment. So I believe we need to take a step back and we need to be able to support candidates on a case by case that will bring the most benefit to the community. And guess what? The analysis for what will bring the most benefit is not why. And it is experimental. And we may disagree and we may make terrible mistakes. You know, uh, uh, Ilhan is somebody that I, that, I, that I communicate with directly. And uh, unfortunately, you know, over the years, I found it that, that as, as I got to see her public position on things that I feel were detrimental to the Muslim community, uh, I, I no longer would be as comfortable, you know, offering the same level of public support that I did early on. Um, do I believe that, uh, you know, people who, for example, promote things that are openly uh, condemned in the Quran and, and dance and parades that celebrate that should be on Muslim conference uh, uh, platforms? No, I don't, quite honestly. I, I agree with Imam Shadi on this. But do I believe and will I hesitate to call Ilhan directly when a Muslim is, is held up by the FBI and she may be able to have some influence to help liberate him or push for policy to change that? Yeah, I will do that. And I'm not going to hide that. Listen, stop doing what you're doing. This is what I disagree with. And, and I will tell you, not all, by the way, Muslim elected officials are like this because I've had the situation with Ilhan. I've had it with another, you know, where uh, I reach out to one you know, elected official that's Muslim and say, listen, you cannot be doing what you're doing. And I don't feel comfortable supporting you if you're going to be publicly promoting these positions. And I understand the difficult nature of it. I don't even care if you vote in support of these things that we disagree with. Maybe you have to follow party lines, but you don't need to be so out there, so pro it on that level. And that person just cut me off. They no longer want to engage with me. And okay, that answered their question for me. Versus someone like Ilhan, I will call her and I will condemn the things that I disagree with. And I will work with her directly to help Muslims on the ground. Because look, I'm responsible, you know, like the, the, the prophet's uncle, he was responsible for his camels. Allah will take care of the Kaaba. OK, I'm responsible for my clients. I'm responsible for those that are suffering. So I'm going to work directly with Ilhan and with anyone else that can help me serve my clients and my community on the civil rights, on the legal issues. 
And I'm not going to endorse the stuff I disagree with. And heck, I'll even tell them I disagree with it. And if they themselves are sincere and they themselves are secure, they'll respect you despite the differences. So, so that's two me, different things. That's a litmus test. Yes. These are two different things. Platforming on a religious basis versus. I, I, I'm with you on that. We shouldn't platform okay. on a religious basis, but we can engage directly. And so that's the position I've taken. Yeah. It's not a zero sum. Your real estate agent, your lawyer, your plumber, who cares what they do? I mm. could care less what they do publicly. He's right. coming for a, 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 a service, right? Exactly. So we have to separate between the issue of uh, our, our, what we endorse as religion, okay, and what is merely a function, right? Mm. Whether it's a legal function, right, or any other function. Correct. There, there's a clear differentiation there, right? Right. Which no, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm aligned with you on that. Like, again, I would not necessarily, uh, you know, I would not platform them in that capacity, but I'll work with them on issues. Now, the issue comes up and here's the contention. Well, OK, what if somebody does platform and then they invite a, another speaker? And then that's where we've seen the condemnations. Oh, well, you share the stage with them. And, and, and that's where, look, look, I think there is, you know, as a layperson, again, I'm speaking as a strategist and a layperson, not as a scholar, but I could see the strategic benefit of why somebody would share the stage, even though they disagree with them. And even though we say maybe they, th that person should have been given a stage. And I can see why somebody would condemn sharing the stage. But but the way we do it, uh, it's, it's I believe, has been very, very destructive uh, and unhelpful, quite honestly. And we've started to really hate each other when really, I think, uh, we're aligned in a lot of ways and we need to stand united and speak out of a place of love, not out of a place of hate. That's what what hurts me is sometimes the hate that I see that mm -hmm. is driven by how we have these conversations. And this happens on the on the activist side just as much, if not more, as on the scholarship side. Hassan, would you say you're in a minority as far as as activists go? If you were to quantify, like, you know, where you're 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 seen as a religiously, traditionally minded activist. Mm. Like, are you the minority amongst the general activist sphere, you think? No, it depends what circles. I think I think there's many people that, mashallah, they're, they're grounding in the deen is much stronger than mine, and they're doing tremendous work for the community. I think in the space that I've been in, uh, possibly, yeah, I would say per perhaps I'm a minority. I don't know. I'll leave that to others to judge. But, sure. you know, I've been straightforward from day one. I grew up as an American Muslim. Uh, I went to law school because I saw the Muslim community being targeted, and I love my deen, and I'm trying to serve both. And, and I hope we can inspire many others to do that with the deen being their priority and how they do things. You know, one thing that I um, I think I point out sometimes, I, I, my observation is that because we're now in a globalized world, with social media being global, right? Mm -hmm. So people who are going to hear this podcast, they're in the UK, Australia, other parts of Europe, South, wherever. I think they have their own set of issues, right? I think American, the, uh, like I almost feel like the audience that we need to start talking to is like American Muslims, like straight up. Because our even Canadians, their politics are different, right? Our politics are very specific. And I think what's happening is that we're hearing a lot of noise. Like, so we'll have British Muslims commenting on our issues and like planting seeds in our brain and like letting that affect our own frame. Like, that's how you guys should be. But like your context is different. Mm. You know what but I mean? There's a, there's a limit to that, though. OK. We have certain guide uh, guidelines that will not change no matter where you are in time and right. place. Right. Mm. And if that's right. what they're commenting on, then it's fair game. Sure. No, 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 no problem. I. I yeah. You know, but but I I, th I think it's but it's it, it's the the kind of maybe laws that specifically impact Muslims. I don't know, like for example, how the FBI targets. You know, why you, Quad S, for example, mm. how it differs from country to country. There may be various levels of it, right? Um, it's also things that we got to look at because now what are people concerned about? Um, people are concerned about their their kids are in public schools, and it's, it's all the social stuff being put in there, the gender pronouns. Yes. Um, that's where it's like drag queens, all that stuff. We don't like where where's that in other if you're in the UK and you're in a predominantly Muslim school, let's say you're in like Bedford or, you know, these, these places are. Is, is that going to happen? Is that being shoved down your throat? Whereas here, if you're in a public school, depending on your state, it could be happening to your kid at kindergarten. Well, right? I'm hearing complaints in the UK and in Canada about this issue, but but I want to, you know, bring in Sheikh Yasser Qadi uh, for a minute on sure. something uh, which really we have to also understand the Muslim community is very infantile when it comes to political engagement. And there really isn't a roadmap for us. I believe that, that we have readily accessible. 
Um, and, and a lot of times like running one of the largest Muslim organizations, like I felt like I was doing HDF, political HDF, but trying to navigate, trying to figure out, we weren't always sure. And Allah knows how much dua we would make by night and by day and seeking forgiveness and doing mashura. And honestly, you would speak to incredible scholars and they, they both would, would, would have completely different opinions. And honestly, nobody necessarily is certain on what to do. I do believe as, as, as Sheikh Shadi said, that there are some foundations within, uh, that, that, that don't change that we can all agree on. But I, I want to give an example with uh, Sheikh Yasser that I can relate to. You know, I saw some condemnation of him, uh, very frankly, because, you know, he took the position that, listen, let's not get involved in, 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 in the gay marriage fight. All right. Let's not take a position one way or another. We know it's haram, obviously. And like, it's insane. Who would who would genuinely believe Sheikh Yasser legitimizes that? I think people are not being genuine in the debate, in the dialogue. You know, Sheikh Yasser was very clear. I, I saw the video that I, we condemn this. I don't want to speak for you, and I'm, I'm going to pass the floor after making the, the relation to myself personally on this. But you said, look, we shouldn't necessarily be involved. And to be honest, that was my position too. Just because we have so much other fights uh, that, that I just, from my perspective, did not think that this is a fight worthwhile for us to fight. Now, I will tell you also, as time grew and I saw, well, wait a minute, look how they overturned Roe versus Wade, look at the potential for engagement. You know what? Maybe Muslims should have aligned on this fight and maybe we should have held ground and maybe it was a mistake and it's okay to have mistakes or to grow or to change. That's natural and allow us to do that, you know, because the issue is, and there was a beautiful quote, those who make no mistakes, and Sheikh Hassan, I'm not saying you made a mistake, I'm just speaking about myself personally on this, uh, is that those who make no mistakes are not doing anything. You know, we're out there on the ground. We're under a lot of pressure. We make decisions based on the circumstances we're at. And, and then as we grow and we see the, the situation, we learn, we adapt, we grow, and we have to allow each other to do that. It's, it's one thing, before we turn it to Sheikh Yasser, that it's one thing for me to say, I'm not getting into this fight. It's Correct. another thing to say, I'm not having an opinion, right? Mm. Our opinion is one. It's an invalid marriage to us, right? Of course. So mm. we're against it. That well, the worst thing... The worst thing is when Muslims are trying yeah. to get and support it. And I'll yeah. tell you, in Florida, I have... I'm just saying, because neutrality in this, there's no neutrality in that. There, there can be discussion on how loud do I want to yell that, right? Mm. And do I want to get into a fight and align? We can discuss all that. But I think we could all agree that... Well, uh, And we have to say it, because some so people... They require so the personal example is this. The, the personal yeah. example is this. In, in Florida, a gay priest actually reached out and he said, we need your support. You know, you're the head of a Muslim organ civil rights organization. We need you to support the fight for gay marriage. This was before gay marriage was like legalized nationally. I told him straight up. I said, listen, uh, there is no way I could be genuine to my faith and my values and support you in your fight for that. It is against the Abrahamic tradition. And you more than anyone should know this. Uh, however, I would never tolerate, obviously, hate crimes and whatnot. This was the position we took. Um, and to be honest, I, I literally told him, I said, we're drowning in our own problems. So we're not going to get involved in the fight. Uh, it, 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 the fight obviously is not aligned with us on a spiritual level. And I definitely won't support it, but I'm not going to get involved because it, it, we just got too much uh, to worry about. And we'll stand against hate crimes. And that was the position, again, we took. Is that the right position, the wrong position? I believe it's a position that there's room for. You know, I, and, I, and, totally, and, yeah. Yeah. I agree with that, but I would be uh, always be mindful anytime that someone that you express opinion, people don't like they're going to spin it to. Well, we're victims. We're getting hated upon. Yeah. We're blah, blah, blah. Well, he actually respected it, though. And we never yeah. had issues. Well, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like everyone we disagree with is on the verge of suicide and on the verge of. No, and this is the problem. And then we really, we really got to pass. That's all it is. The, the last yeah. thing I want to say, and, I, and then we really got to pass the floor. Sheikh Hazard, forgive us. We, we took a, uh, you know, yeah. took a bunch of time. Is that. We as Muslims, we underestimate the understanding nature of the others. We forget that we're on haq, okay? And when there is a nur that comes with that haq, and when you stand for it, people actually respect it. People are seeking it. People are thirsty for it. But they need us to stand our ground. If we don't stand our ground, then we lose that pull that can attract people. Um, so, but yeah, more often than not, they'll be more understanding. And I will tell you this, the least understanding, the least supportive people are the Muslims that adapt that ideology. And they can often be the most toxic and most dangerous. Can I say a little bit now? <laughs> I can squeeze in. Go for it. Okay, Bismillah. I have a number of points to say, a little bit disjointed. I haven't prepared, um, obviously, as a conversation. Uh, but let's begin <clears throat> from the basics. Uh, let us begin with the principle that is universal across the globe in America, England, Canada, between all of us on this platform. We should all agree with the principle the usul, the paradigm that is stemming from our tradition, our faith, 
pretty much all of mainstream Sunnism, dare I even say Shiism and whatnot, would probably acknowledge this principle. It is Quranic in its essence. It is uh, prophetic. The seerah demonstrates this over and over again. And that is the following. The principle is the following. And that is when it comes to engaging with another person whom you disagree with, when it comes to allying yourself with a third party organization person, then you weigh the pros and cons, masalih and mafasid. And the masalih and mafasid are both worldly and religious. Both of these are weighed. And if you feel that overall the masalih of the both dunyawi and dini perspective outweigh, the pros outweigh the cons, then you may ally yourself for the greater good even if there's going to be an incidental a negative that comes that is not intended. You're not rallying for that. You're not calling for that. You're calling for a greater good. And it kind of sort of sometimes necessitates a smaller evil, right? This is pretty much universally acknowledged to be the mainstream principle of, of Sunni Islam. And it is demonstrated in every single strategic alliance, every single, you know, the uh, uh, even throughout Islamic history as well. taqwa comes from the Quran as well. The issue comes in the application, always. The issue comes, who's going to weigh and assess the masalih and the fasid, the, the pros and the cons? Who's going to really go through and figure out, okay, this con here, it is so negative that it outweighs every single pro that you bring to me. And therefore, we come to the very difficult reality, which is that allying yourself with a third party, with a third entity, with another person, always has an element of ijtihad to it. It is not qat'i. It is not from the qat'iyat, uh, uh, from the yaqiniyat. It has a gray area to it. And that is why Ahl sunnah has always made it so problematic to make tabi' based upon associations, to make excommunication based upon your alliance with even a ruler, even a, 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 a dictator and whatnot. And uh, throughout the Arab Spring, I gave multiple posts about this reality that many of our scholars just tacitly supported status quo. They didn't sign the fatwas for the debt warrants, but neither did they stand up and oppose the dictators because they genuinely thought, you know what, this isn't a battle I want to fight. I want to preach and teach the masses. In order to do so, I'll have to give a tacit nod to this evil person. I don't like him, this king. I don't like him. But in the end of the day, you know, it's better than the instability that's going to come. And he, he has to do something negative in order to get that, uh, that overall positive. Now, the principle is undisputed. The application may be disputed. However, we have to be brave enough, mature enough, courageous enough, wise enough that when we dispute the application, we do not make the other person the enemy. We say, I disagree with your application. I know where you're coming from and I really don't like it, but you are not my enemy because your usul is the same. Unfortunately, we don't see this in the online social reality. So when it comes to, for example, this particular, um, and another point, by the way, before I get to the, 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 this particular person, we need to teach our communities. We need to teach our masjid going folks that politicians are not their role models. The role models are the inheritors of the prophets. These are the ulama. Politicians are not where we take our morality from. And if we teach them this, then inshallah it's going to go a long way to try to get to what uh, Brother Hassan was talking about. This also means that since the rule is we weigh the pros and cons, what this means, therefore, is that every single person, every single activist, every single sheikh or da'i actually can take that rule and apply it to his or her personal life. And the net result of that rule might actually be different for that person. Hence, what are the masalih and mafasid for Yasir Qadi to come with that politician versus what are the masalih and mafasid for Care National to go with that politician? It's not the same thing. And we have to raise the academic discourse of our communities to understand that. Sometimes, perhaps usually, the ulama should have the most narrow definition of masalih and mafasid. The ulama should have the highest caliber that, you know what, I don't want to associate with somebody who's so evil or whatnot. And that is why to this day, I have never explicitly endorsed a politician, said to go vote for a politician, myself voted for a politician, fundraise for, you know, one of these people in, in office, never done so. Because I feel the people of knowledge have to have the highest. But I also understand where Hassan is coming from and others are coming from, that if community activists have a different weighing of Masalih and Mafasid, even if I don't agree with it, 
I'm not going to demonize them. I'm not going to problematize them. And if need to, I'll pull them aside. I'll speak to Hassan directly. But I'm not going to make Hassan an evil target for my community. I'm not going to say completely nefariously and slanderously that Hassan Shibli supports, you know, gay marriage because he supports politician X who has supported policy Y. And you make a tasalsul. You make this, you know, uh, 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 a complete McCarthyism of, well, you, you were seen with somebody who was seen with somebody who was seen with somebody. We don't work this way. Ahl sunnah is Islam is above this. So let there be differences of opinion and let there be different tactics for different people. That's always been my position. I am never and I've never preached for supporting a particular politician. Whoever says so is, is really astaghfirullah slanderously lying. I have never. And again, to, now that you're being specific, subhanAllah, as Allah is my witness, I was invited to this conference of Ikna because of family engagements. I flew on Sunday. I flew back Monday morning. Uh, the person you spoke about spoke Saturday. Wallahi, I didn't even know she was speaking until after I came back and some, you know, a storm broke over the internet. The accusation that YQ and Umar Suleiman were asked permission. They gave it. They vetted her. Kadib and slander as usual. Had they asked me, I would have personally said, no, I don't agree. She should be invited to a mainstream Muslim convention. They never asked. If I had known, I wouldn't have stood next to her. I didn't stand next to her. Uh, if I had known, I would have still gone another day. I don't see a problem, by the way, going on Sunday and she's speaking on Saturday. I wouldn't have changed my position. I'll be honest. I don't care what anybody says. You're going to really make everybody a deviant who attends and whatnot. That's a level of khadijism that's just crazy, to be honest. So even if I know she's coming on Saturday, I would have told Ikna, why are you inviting her? And maybe publicly said something to show that I don't agree with that. But I'm not going to boycott an entire convention because I disagree with one speaker. That's not the way uh, forward. Also, mm -hmm. I agree with Hassan's point. And Shadi, I want you to also answer this when you get the microphone back. I need to finish it from your points. That, yes, I agree that they shouldn't be invited. I actually agree with that. But now, are you going to demonize Ikna and say that Ikna or any other organization is tacitly agreeing with everything she says? Or are you going to understand, like Hassan Shibli says, they have their reasons for doing so that I strongly disagree with. They want to have access to her. They want to perhaps persuade her to tone down. They want to, you know, uh, showcase some positives about her. So the application of the principle was misguided. But it doesn't make them misguided. That's really the key point of this entire conversation. Before I finish a few uh, final points here, a simple example, a realistic example. I know for a fact that uh, this person, uh, the one that we're talking about, she has helped numerous families uh, uh, whose, whose um, passports, um, what's the technical term? They're on the no fly list or they're on the, the, they're not given visas or whatever. So they would go to this, this particular Congress lady and she would help them do something totally legal, bring their wives, bring their daughters and children back from these uh, countries that Trump had banned, right? So here's a brother here. His wife and daughters are stuck in that no man's land. Years go by. They go to this Congress lady. She helps them. And mashallah, they're reunited. And this is the law. She has the right to do that. Now, suppose more and more of these refugee families uh, are seeing this is the only person that's helping. I'm being, being hypothetical, even though this is a real example. Suppose they say, this is the only Congress lady that's actually helping. My wife and kids are being living with me now. And so they start fundraising for her and they start spreading the word amongst the community. And they say, you know what? They're helping bringing our wife and kids back, right? My point as Sheikh Yasser Qadi is, I'm not going to demonize those Muslims. I'm not going to go on the platform and raise funds because I disagree with what this lady is doing. But I want to teach my community tolerance. And I'm sorry, but sometimes being you know, a person of knowledge means you have to go against the flow. Wallahi, the easiest thing for me would be to throw her under the bus. The easiest thing for my popularity. And we see what happens when you know, some internet, you know, social media, whatever people, when they do that, their votes go up and they become popular because that's the easiest thing to do. But a person of knowledge has a responsibility. And my responsibility is to raise the bar of education and to teach people that, hey, you know, those refugee families, the masalih for them, they take the same rule that we all agree to and they apply it to this Congress lady. And they say, you know what? I need my wife and daughters. I can't have them in the, the war torn country. And this is the lady that's helping me. I need her to get into office again. I'm going to fundraise for her. I'm going to have the majority of community vote for her. Now you come to this brother and say, brother, don't you know she's dancing at a gay parade? You know what this brother is going to say? He says, astaghfirullah, I don't agree with that. That, but I want my wife and kids to be here, right? That's my point. We need to teach our community that there are two sides. I don't agree with this politician. That's why I've never supported her. Pause here, footnote. Somebody is going to dig through my 2,000 hours of videos, find the small clip here and there, and, you know, embarrass me, whatnot. So let me say for the record, uh, when she was elected, 
and before she danced in the pride parade or whatever, I did have some generic statements that, yes, there's nice to have a hijabi because there's going to be uh, some type of symbolism, some type of generic. So that was before she danced in the parade or whatever. I've never praised her after that video has come up. Not one word since then, because I'm really disappointed and irritated. I also, when her life was threatened by the far right, she really remember that when the FBI got involved and she was threatened, she was the, the, the threat of assassination came because she was a Muslim in Congress, right? And her identity of Islam became paramount, right? At that stage, when the far right wants to kill her, they don't care about her political stances. She becomes a female, black, I'm saying this bluntly, refugee, hijabi lady. Every single negative they have in their minds, she represents it. At that point in time, wallahi, us people have to be wiser. And even if she has views that we strongly disagree with, right? At that point in time when her life is threatened because she represents Islam. I hate what she's done in this aspect. May Allah forgive her and guide her. It's a huge mistake. But at the same time, the people who want to kill her are not killing her for that stance. They're killing her because she represents my faith and your faith. At that point in time, if you are so narrow-minded and so backwards that you don't see the reality that their hatred of her is in fact a hatred of you and your faith and your deen and your prophet, and you don't have the sensibility to come together and protect her as a Muslim, even though you might personally not think she's a Muslim. Here's the irony. You might not even think she's a Muslim, but at that point in time, the far right, not only thinks she is, symbolizes Islam for them, and they want to kill her, vote her out of office. At that point in time, you know, we do have to come together as a community and say, even if I disagree with this stance of hers, she has a right to be a Muslim or claim to be a Muslim or a hijabi or whatever, and she had the right to be in Congress. Now, that nuance is lost on those. I, let me be gentle because my anger is really frustrating sometimes. On those who don't think deeply, uh, to be brutally honest, wallahi, this needs to be said. Those people that are the biggest critics, they are speaking from the luxury of privileged backgrounds. It's not their families caught in war tone zones. It's not them who have to lobby Congress for specific issues. They're coming from positions of privilege and power. They've never really been forced to, you know, get involved with, uh, uh, with the reality of the situation. And they're living relatively comfortable lives. Me personally, I also come from, alhamdulillah, that type of privileged background. That's why I'm not really involved directly, as in and others are. But my point is, as a community leader, as a person of knowledge, mm. I cannot have have two fellow Muslims demonizing each other. I cannot have two Muslims who love Allah, love the messenger, project their weaknesses and their anger onto each other. Final point, I know I've said a lot here. Final point, we also have to be mature enough to rise above finding a simple a simple, you know, target, a scapegoat for the frustration that we feel. We're all frustrated at the rise of the LGBT. We're all frustrated at the stupidity of the trans movement, right? Now, it's so easy to blame, you know, Ilhan or even Astaghfirullah Umar Sulaiman and Yasir Khali, which I've seen so many times. I mean, this is now the default because of these social media, you know, drama queens. They literally say Yasir Qadi and Umar Sulaiman, you know, mainstream Ilhan Umar. That's pure kadib. I've never fundraised for her, never introduced her. Pure lie. They literally say that. And then Ilhan Umar is what made trans movements into America. So basically, Yasir Qadi and Umar Sulaiman are directly responsible for this filth around you. Wallahi, dear parents. Your TV set in your house is a million times more responsible for the corruption of your family than Ilhan Umar, much less, you know, religious figures. So calm down. Don't find an easy target because the target is far more difficult and move beyond demonizing fellow Muslims and understand the world is a very difficult place. Wallahi, we are so hurt at what our sister has done in this regard. I make dua that Allah guides her. You know, somebody said to me, why don't you publicly curse her if that's the case? And I said, you know, you remind me of Imam Ahmed uh, and, and his son, Abdullah. When Abdullah said to Imam Ahmed that, oh, Imam Ahmed, uh, do you love Yazid? And Imam Ahmed said, can any Muslim love Yazid? Can any Muslim love somebody who's supporting LGBT dancing at a gay parade? And so uh, uh, Abdullah said to his father, why don't you curse Yazid? And uh, uh, Imam Ahmed said, have you ever seen me to be vulgar, you know, cursing another, you know, Muslim? I don't see the point of cursing or whatnot, but I make dua for her. And I have very clearly disobeyed dua that Allah guides her. And I very clearly have dissociated from such politicians in every lecture I say that, look, these politicians, we don't learn our morality from them. We don't learn our akhlaq from them. We learn that from the ulama. But I still say, if Hassan Shibli calls her up 
and wants to get benefit from her, I don't demonize Hassan Shibli. If Ikna wants to invite her for some perverted application of their logic and their view that, you know what, she needs to see that these 10,000 Muslims support her because of her Islam, so she needs to be guided to correct Islam. They're trying to use it as a token. And by the way, that is what Ikna's philosophy was. They told this to me, and I said, that's really foolish, but that's your business. I literally, they said that to me, right? Now, but the point is, they agree with the principle. I'm not going to demonize Ikna. I'm not going to throw Ikna under the bus, which is what, unfortunately, so many of these social media warriors are doing. And that is dangerous because it is. Anyway, I've spoken a lot. You're, 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 you are literally considering the bulk of the ummah to be misguided and evil. If you're going to take this to logical conclusion, that's exactly what the Kharijites did. Go ahead and disagree. Say Ikna made a mistake but Ikna is not evil. Go ahead and say, I strongly disagree, but that doesn't make the other person an evil person who supports evil and Valtan. That's the key point I need to get across. And with that- Sheikh Yasser, I want to like ask you to um, clarify something real quick. You said, just because I'm doing an, I'm auditing what you said, and I'm like thinking about how someone's going to like run through your statement with a fine tooth comb. As um, they always do, which is, by the way, again, that's a problem. Wallahi, it's a problem. Even this attitude, and I've spoken against this so many times. Wallahi, if your niya is to just find faults and find the ambiguous word, may Allah help you there. I mean, like, any, uh, it's not Islam anyway. This it, is it, not the way forward. I Anyway, what's your question? I, I'll, I'll ask you. So basically, so because you mentioned that, people, that you're right, that people are claiming that, you know, Omar Suleiman and Yasser Qadi are, per, are platforming this kind of behavior, this person, and therefore this kind of behavior, et cetera, et cetera, right? I think you should speak for yourself because what's going to happen is you're clarifying your own position here. What they're going to do is you're going to take that clip and be like, well, Omar Suleiman said did this. I, I don't know what Sheikh Omar Suleiman did, but like, I, I think you should just like cover yourself and just say, I speak for Yasser Qadi only. You, does that make I sense? Do, I do speak for Yasser Qadi only. <laughs> Looking um, like a true I lawyer. Spoken, I have spoken. <laughs> yes, I sent you a lawyer. I have spoken to Sheikh Omar many times and, uh, Overall, I know that he's in agreement with, with me about these principles, the qawaid. Right. right. So even if we disagree about the application, we go back to my point here. Right. Is that if he sees a masalih and a, a, a pro and con that's different than mine, right? Yep. And he understands in his worldview that this is better for the ummah, even if I disagree, and I will, and I have disagreed, and he's disagreed with me, and I call him up. We, you, everybody knows we are in direct contact with one another, and we agree to disagree. Sometimes I'll literally text him, you know, Sheikh, I don't agree, you should have done that. And he'll do the same with me. It doesn't diminish the good that he's done. And I don't demonize his entire life because of uh, an error in the application, or uh, what I believe to be an error in the application. And this goes back to another point. Hassan brought it up very well. Subhanallah, what is wrong with understanding that this rule can change from time to place to person? Now, when I said I'm going to be neutral in this regard, right? This was in when the Supreme Court was just about to rule in its favor, right? And we knew it was a lost battle. As Hassan said, hindsight's 2020, maybe we should have done something else. So what? The application can change from time to time. It's the principle that does not change. And it wasn't a universal um, you know, rule that I said, we're always going to remain neutral. It was actually about California and what was it, Proposition 8, eight or whatever. During a time, people have forgotten how, you know, how... Islamophobic the environment was, you know, in the time of Obama. People have forgotten. They have a short memory span where these video to the DVDs of, you know, is the rise of Islamic, uh, you know, fascism in America was going rampant. And we were genuinely worried about our civil liberties. 22 states are trying to ban the Sharia. At that point in time, is it the wisest battle to take on, you know, New the LGBT front. lobby at that point in time? And, you know, Maybe if I were to go back to that time and place, I would have changed my views, but maybe I wouldn't. At that point in time, I gave my best judgment and its application could be wrong. Allahu a'lam. But to read into that, that a'udhu billah, there is a support or there's an endorsement. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. This is subhanaka hadha buhtanun azim. You know, this is a siyasa and siyasa is very different, very different from uh, uh, the ahkam of the shara. Right. Could, and, uh, uh, go ahead. I mean, if I could just add something to that, there may be another element to the discussion that is not political nor religious, but on the level of pers persuasion and even if we could say branding and driving people's focus, uh, activists who have to deal with all sorts of crowds to get their passports, et cetera, and imams who are people go to when they're penitent and they need to learn about Allah and they need to change their ways. So there may be an element here where uh, yeah, I may totally support Hassan's dealing with anybody who can get people their paperwork. 
right? But me, myself, if, or you yourself, Sheikh Yasser, if you were to, to be with these people, your audience would be confused, right? I had a teacher. He was a purist, okay? And it was just Dean. And it made the matter clear because I know what I'm getting from this person. Then they sort of changed their ways a little bit and they're all over in different meetings, right? Political, non-political, whatever. So it, can, it muddied the water of what this person is offering, right? This is not to say he did something haram or wrong, but we're also communicators. Dawah is communication. I want to drive your attention to one set of things. It, I can't muddy the water and get you confused. 100% Perception with you. is a reality. 100% yeah. with you, Sheikh Shadi. That's why in my own personal life, I have tried my best to stay away from rulers and, and dictators and politicians because I do believe I do believe that ulama should not mix. I'm a talib al-ulama, but I'm saying overall the ulama class should not mix with the, 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 the salatin. And in fact, there are prophetic traditions of this nature. And when ulama do mix with the salatin, what usually happens, as you said, it confuses the masses. So, and of course, because of why I have had offers to go to rich oil nation countries, whatnot. No, I don't want that. And I've had offers here in this land to, no, I don't want that. But that's my mawqif and my strat strategy. You and I both know in our own, you know, scholarly circles, a number of prominent people have, for whatever reason, gone their way. And I have disagreements with that, but I have never publicly lambasted them because of this. Because it goes back to this principle, it goes back mm -hmm. to exactly, even though, wallahi, my heart hurts at the alliances towards some, you know, uh, oil rich uh, pro Israeli uh, countries in the Middle East whose names shall not be uh, mentioned. But my, my, my heart hurts. Wallahi, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And I have expressed that pain directly to these people involved. But because I try to be consistent in app applying this principle, and that is that whatever perverted way they're looking at it, they actually think the Masalah are more than the Mafasid in their own weird view. That's mm -hmm. the way they view it. You know, it's literally like. You know, people thought that uh, in the time of the fitna, you know, allying with Muawiyah versus Ali versus whatever, they have their views. You know what I'm saying? Yani, what are you going to do about it? Okay. So, so Sheikh Yasser, yeah, I, I think there's, so let's use that example of like some of these ulama who support like these like di dictators. Perceived okay, okay. No, no names are here. When no names. To, okay. cannot have any names. I'm not going to be specific then. No problem. Okay. So laymen, first of all, do you think it's appropriate for lay people because lay people are really, you can call it like they're they're attacking them without any like they're not holding back, right? On social media, other podcasts, you will hear these people criticized a lot, right? And I could hear what you're saying because they're using this, and some of these ulama have like at status of they they probably are mujtahidin, right? They are senior scholars, right? So they're doing their ijtihad, and you're saying we disagree with it. Right, but the application we disagree with, but they have a but their usul is probably sound. It's just their application is misguided. Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, let me. I said. Let me make one exception, and that exception is when it is patently clear that it's not a matter of masalah and mafasid, but you have sold yourself to the highest bidder. When you endorse the killing of civilians, when you call peaceful protesters the dogs of hellfire, you know, when you give carte blanche authority to a brutal dictator, you know, to kill multazimin in a masjid, I'm sorry, you've lost all excuse. Okay. Now, a third party looks at the situation and says, you know what, these brutal dictators, if we unsheath the sword, you know, it's going to cause civil war and to have these brutal dictators is better than civil war. I understand, even though you know, my position is very clear in my lectures and talks and which countries have banned me and which not. Everybody knows this, right? So my lectures are patently clear. Other people have given other tasawwarat uh, and I strongly disagree. It's painful. But as I said, there is a difference between bootlicking and between generic endorsement for the sake of a greater good. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think people got to be honest because I, I, I would, just before this recording, I was asked if I would be interested in interviewing somebody who may be perceived as anti one of these countries right and i was like you know what i might i probably gotta fly through there at some point i don't think i i, I don't want the smoke <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's just like because you you want to make things you're not trying to give yourself a hard time necessarily either i think that's what it is like if you're put in a corner and some of these guys they probably live there and like what choice do you have right 
one of the things just to jump on is like let's be real growing up as an american muslim yeah. i mean we are under so much pressure and a lot of the scholars even if we may disagree on their fiqh or their politics their work helped preserve our love for the deen our love for allah and his messenger like our children they're dealing with issues of actual atheism i think atheism and secularism that is the biggest thing and we need to be cultivating the goodness out of the youth. But the issue we're forgetting, when I see any in, uh, you know, person who served 10, 20, 30, 40 years in Dawa, 40 years in service, and trying to literally destroy that person out of a political stance they took, that's, 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 that's not who we are as Muslims. And I think that's destructive. And we're heading in a projection where over time, the shayateen will perhaps succeed in canceling every alim, every scholar for something so that the general people say, well, we can't trust any alim. But it's not the problem, it's not the ulama or their positions. They may be correct, they may be wrong, but the usul is there. The problem is, is our standards, that you must be perfect in everything. And, and to that, I remember the Sahabi who warned uh, the Quraysh that the Prophet was invading. And Umar radiallahu anhu, wanted to cut off his head and Rasulullah said you know there's a man of better how do you know Allah not look at him and forgive him and he had his reasoning it was flawed reasoning he's like you're going to be victorious anyway and I just wanted to protect my family and I knew Allah was going to help you and really he committed treason but in that case the Prophet did not condemn his whole life based on one bad horrible decision he made it was the opposite he actually purified his life sanctified his life based on some good he's done and, sure, and, so. you know we need to again mention this as well that some of our Yani especially our uh, youth, and, and they don't like these terms overzealous or neo I understand that we did use them in the past, and it's not going to get across to them when we use that. Okay, so I, you're right. We shouldn't use these terms. But their sincerity is in the right place. But with utmost love, they haven't examined history. These trends are common and standard. You feel that you have this, this puritanical zeal that I want to establish 100% authentic. But the world doesn't work that way. And people that are double, triple your age have just as much zeal, but they also have more wisdom and knowledge than you. And they understand that it can't be this simplistic. So what we find here, a lot of our passionate youth are the biggest critics of the woke cancel culture, even as they embody the worst elements of the cancel culture when they cancel senior ulama, dua, double, triple their age for what they perceive to be a mistake even though it might not even be a mistake, or at max, it is an issue. They had the issue of a gray area. So we need to raise the bar and teach our youth with utmost love and respect. Listen, if you don't agree with a particular sheikh, go to another sheikh. But inshallah, within the scholarly community, you're not going to find the, the type of rhetoric and the type of dismissal and the type of tabian accusations that, unfortunately, uh, the internet has become rife with. We need to keep on teaching our community to stay away from that. You know, I, I, th I think I've gotten criticized myself because people have called me a scholar worshiper. Because I'm like, laity should not be criticizing ulama. But that's like my bottom line position, right? Just because you don't, you haven't done the work. If, if you can't, if you haven't done Arabic and your fatahah doesn't have tajweed, like stay silent, right? Even if you, it like, that, that's what the bandwagon is, right? So, uh, but but I was going back to the point is like, that's, we, we assume that these people have the capability to make ijtihad. We've been throwing this term ijtihad around. And we're saying that like, ikna kind of did ijtihad. Hassan says you got to do sometimes on the fly ijtihad, right? Because you just don't know what's going on. You're in a situation. You don't got time to call Sheikh Yasser or anybody else that might help you out. Um, I Some people feel that people, organizations like ICNA and other people are using ijtihad too loosely. No, 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 no. Mahin, Mahin, Mahin. There's different types of ijtihad. Okay. If you're lost in the desert, yeah, right? right? And you don't know which way to pray. Right. Okay? Yep. Believe you me, you don't want to ask Sheikh YQ yeah. because I am totally jahil when it comes to, you know, figuring out north, south, east, and west from looking at the sun, okay? Right, right. That's, you make, and in fact, the scholars say, if you're confident that mm. you know the direction of the Qibla based on your own intuition and your knowledge of the, the lay of the land, right? Right. Your ijtihad is binding on you and you don't care about anybody else's ijtihad. So when we say ijtihad, we have to be careful here. We are not talking about fiqhi ijtihad. We're not talking about ijtihad from the nusus, deriving rulings from the Quran and Sunnah. I just said, what does the principle say? You weigh the pros from a worldly and a religious perspective. And you weigh the cons from a worldly and a religious perspective. Hence, if you know a, a, a person from one of these war-torn countries doesn't have his wife and children, right? The maslaha for him 
is to get somebody that's going to get his wife and children to, to and that's a maslaha. That is a pro that I don't need to worry about. So for that particular person to ally with a politician, to raise funds for that politician, because they believe this politician will help bring more families and reunite families, right? That's an ijtihad that is based upon his circumstance. Hence, ijtihad that we're talking about is not the ijtihad of the Quran and Sunnah. It is using your best judgment. The same thing that I can say to you, Mahin, that you're not a doctor. You're, uh, you're going to go to two, three doctors for medical analysis. Which one is right? You're going to make ijtihad. By here, I don't mean fiqhi ijtihad. I mean you use your best judgment based upon your knowledge about which doctor is the best for you. The same goes for allying yourself with various groups and organizations. Get feedback from ulama, from experts. But in the end of the day, you have to do what's best for your life. And if your wife is struck, stuck in a war-torn country, right, and you need to de de develop relationships with a, 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 a politician that has certain evil or whatnot, well then, for you, that maslaha overweighs and outweighs the, the mafsada of that personal politician's stance on, uh, on that moral issue. Does that make sense? It, it does. And therefore, I said, scholars, in my humble opinion, this is my opinion, should have the highest bar. And that's why I refuse to appear. I have been invited. I don't want to say too much. I have been invited on political platforms. Why do you think you've never seen me introduce a political candidate? Because I don't believe that's what I want to do with my life. Whoever does it, good for them. That's their business. I'm not speaking about them. Me personally, I don't want to do that. Because I feel the people of inheritors of the Prophet, وسلم, may Allah make me amongst them, whatever small level that might be, they have to rise above this. And they cannot be directly involved with such people but we cannot apply that bar to uh, care to political organizations whose interests are not moral or theological and i have to say our community please raise your bar of understanding you cannot expect a civil rights organization that's interested in muslim civil rights to have the same understanding as your shuyukh of the masjid they're looking at the world in a very different way and for you to not differentiate and to assume that your civil rights organization has to weigh the masalih and mafasid of your local sheikh exactly the same. I think you're not seeing the forest for the trees as the saying goes. Yes, but like, so Ikna isn't a, but, but Ikna seems to represent the Muslim populace, right? So w when they're saying they, they're making this decision, you would think that they would consult with like, I know they have, they have access to scholars, right? So what goes down that caused them to make like some kind of unilateral decision listen, to platform somebody? Right? Listen, I don't like talking about third parties when they're alive and easily contactable. I don't represent right. Ikna. Right. I'm not. I'm not their lawyer. Right. You know, they're a mainstream organization, and you know, they invited me to a conference, and I went, and I'll go again next year. Right. My my going to believe that it is a tacit endorsement of all 100 speakers is a level of naivety that is just ridiculous. I mean. I went, I spoke, and I, I didn't even know who was speaking the day before me. Now, if they had asked me for the record, I would yeah. have said she should not be invited. If they had refused to listen and still invited her for the record, I would have still gone the next day. But I would have made a point to make sure that people understand I don't support you know, what this particular politician is doing. Again, sure. that's my position. But listen, Shadi, Sheikh Shadi, suppose you said, how dare Ikna invite and I don't want to go and I refuse to go. And that's it. I would have respected that. But if you went beyond this and said, this means Ikna is supporting gay marriage, I would have called you out and said, no, it doesn't. They have their own uh, way that they're applying the usul, and you have the right to vehemently disagree. You have the right to get angry, but you do not have the right to start labeling them as mubtadi' because you've disagreed with their masalih mufaz. Do you agree with? Uh, I agree I with that. The, the concept of talazm that, that something necessitates something else sometimes is direct and sometimes cannot be direct. Right? And in this case, it's indirect. In this case, in when this it case, no, it doesn't necess necessitate because the topic was different. The topic that she's speaking yeah. about is different. Yes. If they had chose to her to speak on that topic, then we could say that telezum is definite, right? Agree. Hundred percent agree. Hundred yeah. percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you know who has it really much harder than us? How about the ulama in Azhar? Let's say uh, when they had their fitna. Right. With their governments and their That's Arab Spring. Exactly yeah. what I just said is that if you look and, and I've lived in another country, oil rich country, that I know many of my scholars, many of my teachers really did not like the ruling authorities, but they would still 
generically give their you know two cents praise and whatnot and nobody criticized that we all understand what do you want to do not everybody's cut out to be a martyr not everybody's want to wants to go to jail and honestly maybe if i were in that citizenship maybe i too would give my two cents praise and then move on with my life because i don't want to go to jail i have bigger things to fight so i, I humbly say Many of the people who are harsh critics are speaking from a place of privilege. They've never actually had to face the reality of, you know, a situation where, you know what, I might have to compromise a little bit of evil to gain a lot of good, right? It's usually people that are in very difficult circumstances that have to make that decision. I too have been privileged, alhamdulillah, but I'm trying to teach my community to raise the bar of knowledge. Like I said, I actually agree with you, Shadi, 100%. But my only issue is we can't demonize Hassan. We're making him as an example here. You know, I, I know you don't mind Hassan saying. We can't consider Hassan or these other institutions to be the embodiments of evil. And we have to agree to disagree with Adab and civil. And again, listen, Hassan, you're a representative of CARE still, right? To work with CARE and everything. No, I, I used to, but I'm in private yeah. practice now. I mean, listen, yeah. in the end of the day, we can all disagree with certain things that CARE does. But there is no other organization that has done as effective uh, civil rights for the American Muslim community. Do you agree with me? 100 percent. 100 percent. We can disagree with their tactics, but to make them to be, you know, the harbingers of evil, to make them to be shayateen al-ins, which is what some of our youth do. May Allah protect our youth from ever having to call them for an actual need. Because when push comes to shove and when they get fired for a beard or whatever, there is no other organization that they're going to have to call other than care. You know, and it's at that point now they're going to understand, hey, I demonized them, but now I need to use them because nobody's doing what they're doing in the end of the day. And mm-hmm. again, I disagree with many things about care, but still, I respect what they do, even as I disagree. Can't we get to this level of maturity where we understand that they're on our side of the, uh, in the end of the day, even if some of the tactics they employ, we can strongly disagree with. So we, we've uh, had that I, know, I want to be explicit. Do you agree with that analysis that I've just said? I do. Okay. okay. I agree I with it. Be- I, I, I agree with it, it in that there is a separation between people who have to fulfill functions. Mm-hmm. One function, you need a certain toolkit and you need certain associates. Okay. Another function, you need different toolkits and you have different associates. Right? It's not, so you cannot yeah. judge care like you judge, judge you know, your sheikh of the yeah. masjid. Each mm-hmm. one has, and that's why my humble position, the ulama really should have the highest bar. And we need to teach our community the differences between morality from ulama versus morality from politicians and civil rights organizations. Yeah. As, an, as an example, real quick, Sheikh, to echo your point, um, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, 2015, there were four brothers arrested. I don't know if you, you remember the story. Very uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no one remembers the story. <laughs> um, they were arrested um, on, on terror charges. Mm-hmm. And many of those brothers, they I went to undergrad with them. And uh, they were very anti-care. It would be like, oh, care. They don't, that means I don't care about the sunnah. <laughs> care are sellouts. Yeah, sellout. right, right. Yeah, exactly. But exactly, right. But then when I read what who was who was trying to back trying to help them out today, it was care. So I was like, it's funny how they you when you're pushed up against the wall because it's, it's yeah when when we're young and we're like like you know. Dealing with, because e- e- even now, I was telling um, a-, a sheikh that recently came to um, visit us in Chicago, and I was like, listen, sheikh, you know, I felt myself like as I joined a professional world and I go in the office, I- it kind of changed who I was. Like, I couldn't be in my MSA bubble anymore, right? And then you're like, is like, is like, I don't know if I'm being more liberal or what. And he was like, well, listen, maybe there are things you're falling short on, but just increase your toba, right? Kind of thing, right? Because on, sometimes it's like, but, but I think the problem is like going back to the the people we're trying to reach right now, people look at things very black and white. Because even in, amongst all of this, I bet you they will come out and say, you guys still didn't address the issue that you, they won't say, Ikna can do Ijtihad or not do Ijtihad. They'll be like, Ikna can't do Ijtihad. Y'all are wrong. That's what you'll get oh, some response like that. Yeah. Look, uh, and of know? course, they're not understanding that nobody's saying Ikna can right. do Ijtihad. You know, we're talking about the practical day-to-day shit. But one of the points I want to mention real quick is you can tell a lot about an organization and even a people by their enemies. Right. And subhanAllah, when you look at CARE, you're looking at who's working day and night to destroy the organization. It isn't even the the, the Islamophobes as much as it is the secular pro so-called Muslims that want to destroy anything they see as even traditional.
traditional leaning and and alhamdulillah having served the care family for 10 years you know uh, although i no longer i'm on their paycheck but i love them and they're they're on my paycheck i, I love to support them i encourage every muslim to support them uh but the issue it's very interesting is we we have to talk to each other before we talk about each other i i'll never forget that once a brother messaged me very angry and he said you know hassan this is why i only support activists like you and not so and so i mean look at so and so and so and so had shared uh something uh written by a very bad person Let, let's just put it that way i'm not even going to mention who they are what they did they were so-called muslim but of that pro qamlut and anti-ibrahim and everything you know what i did i picked up my phone i called i said why are you sharing this they legitimate didn't know and the minute i told them they deleted it and removed it you know and and i saw this happen with care as well uh <laughs> Uh, actually, I, somebody reached out and said, you know, CARE just shared this by such and such that supports XYZ openly, and even the context is just not appropriate. I did an internal investigation. I was working for the org. It turns out I was an intern that didn't know what the heck they were doing. Our organizations are not infall infallible, and they, they consist of hundreds of people. And there are, I, I would say the majority of the people are leaning towards Huck. They may not know everything, but they want to do the right thing. And there are people that are just grounded in the wrong long path. We need to work with those who want Huck and support them and aid them, not destroy them. And I will tell you this, sometimes it does help that they put feet to the fire, you know, our, our, our feet to the fire, you know. It, 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 so there is, I believe, always khair in, in the right kind of pressure, but it has to be the right kind. And after speaking to, not speaking about and talking past. And, and you know, one of the ways you can say, you can tell the, the difference is how the message of nasiha is given. Mm -hmm. Any time a person becomes infamous for always creating a public scandal rather than going to the people or individuals directly, something is wrong, okay? I spoke with Ikna's leadership directly, directly. And I can assure you the level of, you know, comprehension I got about, well, they they, they understood they made a mistake. They shouldn't have, uh, have done this. They, they should have asked other people, right? This was their pros and cons. That subhanAllah, if whoever criticized Ikna had only approached them before creating drama on the internet, right? When your main focus is to create drama immediately within the Muslim community, I'm sorry, you don't have the concerns of the Muslim community at heart. When you think that all major organizations care, Isna, Ikna, Mass are all sellouts. When you think all of the mainstream du'at are pro-LGBT liberals, who's left? You are literally destroying the entire ummah. And as the Prophet said, whoever considers the entire ummah to be destroyed, he is the most destructive of them. This isn't the spirit of Nasiha. Subhanallah, if any if somebody had just called me and said, Sheikh, did you support Ikna's decision to invite Ilhan Umar? I would have said immediately. They didn't ask. I had no clue she was there. But no, immediately the slander is created. Why Q and O? And I, I know Sheikh Omar wasn't asked because because uh, uh, Ikna told me, and I asked Omar as well. Sheikh Omar as well. Nobody was asked, but the slander was created. We endorsed. We said to Ikna to invite, and we and, and we did this. Subhanallah. When you have people like this, we ask Allah to protect us from their from their evil. You know when that video came out because like we were trying to figure out like what what did Yakin do, right? It was it was Yakin Yakin and YQ, right? And then I when we dug into it, it felt like that brother who made the video he was attacked for being an Ikna. So he was trying to cover it, you know, it's like, because someone else criticized him for being there. He's like, why would you, why would you share a platform with Ilhan, right? Okay, I don't want to say too much, but the brother has my number. He could have texted. Right. Well, I first right. heard it when he called. Anytime you're going to go straight to video, yep. anytime you have a person. And you know what? Every critic of mine online, every one of them, if they don't have my number, there's one person between me and the number they can immediately contact or my email is public, right? right. None. And I repeat, none, not one of these infamous videos that have been released about me have ever, that person has ever contacted me and asked for clarification and then said, you know what? I'm not satisfied for the sake of the haq. I'm going to have to, you know, call you out. No. And in particular, may Allah forgive, but this brother, we had previous interviews, we have communication. And nothing, nothing. Next thing I know, like, what? Are you serious? This guy released a video? Anyway, mm -hmm. we ask Allah for the bats and we I mean, ask Allah I mean. for ikhlas. Wallahi, the most important thing on the day of judgment, nobody can bring a claim against me. May my, my, my heart be pure. And I could use this opportunity, but I'm not going to. They're one of the most outspoken critics of, of you, Sheikh Yasser. You know, maybe the yeah. most. Maybe the most. I remember I met him at a conference where... People of all kinds of orientations were present. He was invited. And I, and I was kind of like, well, people could say that you were platform here, but there's a double standard at the end of the day, right? I'm not going to get into the details. Maybe they have, a, they have an advantage over us in that, subhanAllah, we are restricted by the prophetic sunnah to go to their level. And I, 
it's painful because we could say so much, but right. we can't. And we leave our fear to Allah. And I am I am certain from my own past experiences because I've been through much worse than my Medina days with the Madkhalis. I've been through much worse. Mm. Al mm. If I correct between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then mm. in the end, the result will, the victory will be mine. So I need to concentrate on myself. And uh, frankly, and I'll say this in front of my critics, the reason why you have even an ounce in public is because of my personal sins. My sins are coming back to me through you. I am saying this publicly. You are a result of my own sins. So if I correct my own sins, there shall be a bigger and, and more protection. And the more better I am in the eyes of Allah, Azza wa Jal, the more the honor will be protected. So you are all secondary. All of us, we have to concentrate on, on him. And the rest, you know, in Allah, yudafiru anil ladina amanu. So we have to have iman and Allah Azza wa Jal will protect us. End sure. of story. Sheikh Yasser, one of the things that uh, one of the things I actually respect you a lot for, because you know, we, we were we were reminiscing when we last came to Chicago, I've known you for 17 years. Both you and I were very different 17? back then. 17 years. Wow, bro, I'm old, man. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I remember. 30 plus years old. How old are you, man? <laughs> I'm, I'm 40. I'm 40. No way. Yeah. <laughs> bro, it's like time flies. Yeah, I'm so almost 50. So I, I, I remember the day I, picked, I first met you. I picked you up at a Columbus airport, and I was wearing a thobe and a turban. I remember and, that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then I, <laughs> I was telling some brothers that, like, you probably thought I was a Mudkali spy or something, the way I was interrogating I, I really you. did. The way you – the questions you asked, the way that you were interrogating me, <laughs> literally just five minutes in, and you're just like, <laughs> who is this guy? Like, so, yeah, I did. Uh, right, sure. right. So, um, but, but I've seen you evolve, um, and some people have this – like, I, I feel like – I understand you in the sense that you are your sincerity is leading you to always flesh ideas out and entertain new things, right? Because understanding that you don't know it all, right? So you're learning, you're growing, you're changing perspective, you get different perspectives, you're changing, right? Um, so some people see that as okay, that's fine, but why why would you do why would you shake Yasser shouldn't do that publicly because it adds confusion. Do you understand what they're what they're coming from? There's an element of validity to that. I, I sympathize with that sentiment. Okay. Um, the response to that would be life is a never ending learning process. So at what stage will the person say, Khalas, I've arrived at the ultimate truth? Never. You're continuously going to keep on thinking and rethinking. And uh, subhanAllah, I'll be, again, I'm always brutally honest here. Our problem in North America was that 9 11 created a vacuum of scholarship and of community leadership that didn't exist. And Allah's Qadr was there. A group of us happened to come back post 9-11 in that vacuum. And we were sucked up in that vacuum far above our maqam deserved. We didn't deserve that. We were too young, but it's not our fault in that the community needed. And, you know, Al-Maghrib Institute came at the right time and everything. it was just the right time and place and the next generation needed some type of stability. So I honestly believe had I come back 20 years ago, pre 9-11, I mean, not 25 years ago, no, yeah, had I come back in the 1990s after having studied what I studied, I wouldn't have been platformed so extensively because there were other people, there were other movements, things were happening. It's just the reality that happened in the status quo. And therefore, be, look, had I just been an average Sheikh, you know, in my 30s, these mistakes that people pick up on would have remained small halakhat error. The internet, YouTube, the celebrity status has all exacerbated what is actually the norm, what people don't realize. You think Ibn al-Qayyim was the same at 60 than he was at 30? Mm. You think Sheikh al-Islam, Sheikh al-Islam, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry to just burst the bubble of the Salafis, he joined the Sufi tariqah when he was 18. He gave bay'ah in a Sufi tariqah. You know, that's definitely not Ibn Taymiyyah in his 40s, 50s. You know what I'm saying? This is a natural evolution of a person of knowledge. But because of the, you know, uh, uh, Asif, not Asif, because of the uh, imprint that social media has, that everything you say is recorded. And so, and then you have these people that are going to uncover something from 10 years ago. And he said this and that. It is what it is. Pre-internet era, your mistakes as you evolve over time would have been overlooked. So it is, there's an element of truth, but at gentle pushback, what's the alternative? I mean, you have to give da'wah in your 20s and 30s when you come back. You have to preach and teach. And if people 
start listening and then they see you evolve, well then let's hope they evolve with you. Or if they remain where, where, where I was once upon, inshallah, they're still good at that. I've said this, mind was on your interview. It's yeah. not as if the movement I left is an evil shaitani movement. I've said this publicly. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that movement. It has a lot of khair. But I have moved on. It's up to them. If they want to remain there, that's fine. If they want to move with it's fine. Right. No, I, I, I remember the days when you weren't on the celebrity circuit and we had to fight to get you just on like an MSA national stage. <laughs> I remember that as well, that they, they didn't want me because they thought I was too fundamentalist at the time. Right, right, right. Yeah. For sure. So this is probably a good time because what's making the rounds um, recently is the interview, an interview you did on Al Jazeera with Mehdi Hassan and Linda Sarsour back in 2015. Um, and there's people are, it, it, that's another video that's being rehashed now. Right. And I, and I feel like people are kind of want to understand what's going on. And pe people have said, people who are giving you the benefit of the doubt is like, maybe Sheikh Yasser shouldn't have gone on that platform because Mehdi Hassan, th there comes to be a, you have to have a certain level of understanding when you're going to go. Like, so, uh, Hassan, you, you were on with the Tucker Carlson before. Yeah, I've been with all. I don't keep track. Yeah, you know. Fine. Yeah, for example, yeah. so yeah. O'Reilly, Tucker Carlson, Mehdi yeah. Hassan. These guys are professional interrogators, right? Um, and there's the critique of you. One of the critiques was that Sheikh Yasser, with all due respect, should have realized that. Hey, I'm walking into a lion, like a like like the the hornet's nest here, right? Um. A field that is not my area of expertise. It's not right. academic. Yeah, right. it's not academic Islam, which would be totally easy for me. And right. it's not shiuch, debating fiqh points. Right. Yeah. But yeah. when you're approached like that back then, what's the mindset when you're first approached for it? You obviously you're approached for an interview for some kind of panel, yeah. right? Um, like and again, Linda Sarsour in 2015 is different than Lin what we know about her. Her back then, you know, I, I remember we I invited her on Mad Mamluks. We, we I met her in 2016 at Iman at the uh at one of the they had a street festival and me and uh, Sim went up to her and we, we gave her salams. We're like, we'd love to have you on sometime. And she's like, hey, I'm really busy with the voting, th with the election right now. But hit me up after, right? So We invited her too. Right. You know, so yeah. people evolve back, over time. Yeah. And it's, yeah. It's, it's dangerous to back project. Like I said, even me, I have two or three generic statements praising Alhan when she first got as a hijabi. Right. Right. And then the stances weren't known back then. You know, she didn't dance until whatever year. So to find that clip and then say, oh, he's supporting or whatever. Same with the, with the other sisters as well. But anyway, uh, to, to get to your point, there's an element of truth to this. And you're absolutely right, Mahin, that uh, whoever walks into these types of, of um, uh, interviews uh, should be uh, completely prepared to do so. Um, I have been interviewed by, by multiple CNN, Fox, you know, NPR, been on many times. Um, overall, Overall, I, I always pray istikhara on a personal spiritual note. I always make dua to Allah, is this the best thing to me, for me to do or not? And I prayed at that time as well. My goal, of course, is always between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My goal is that what I consider to be mainstream Islam rarely gets a chance to be represented at NPR, at CNN, or whatever it might be. Like to get a, a, a person who's grounded in the tradition to try to explain to a broader audience, Okay. So this is my mindset that it's not as if it's between me or two or three other shuyukh. If they don't invite me, they're probably going to get some hardcore progressive guy. So weighing that, right, is it the lesser of two evils, once again, that I go on and perhaps slip up, make a mistake or two, and overall present some, some orthodox beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. It's a risk. It's a, pro, it's a, a risk-benefit, a cost-benefit analysis. So inshallah, I pray Allah Azza wa Jal, allows me to erase my ego or overcome my desire of fame and whatnot. The goal is that we don't get enough representation as mainstream Muslims. And once again, it's not as if it's between me and, you know, Sheikh Shadi or somebody. It's typically between me or between, you know, some complete, yani, I don't want to mention names here, but some academic PhD in Islamic studies who has no interest or love of the tradition. You get my point here, right? Right, right. Between those two, I'd rather come and, and it's not my area. I'm going to be the first to say politics is not my area. Uh, interviews with, with these types of cutthroat, you know, journalists is not my area. 
I don't go around sending my resumes to these people. I want to come on your show once in a blue moon. You know, my name is going to be pushed to them. And every time I pray istikhara, and sometimes I say no, sometimes I say yes when I feel that. And I have said no to more interviews than I've said yes, by the way. For the, I'm going on the record for this. I have said no to more interviews because I feel this is not suitable for me for whatever reason, right? That particular interview, again, um, I said a phrase in there that definitely was not the wisest phrase and it has been misunderstood. And I need to clarify that. And no doubt, if a person messes up, it should be clarified. And I'm going to clarify that. But also, may I gently remind our Muslim viewers that if a person makes an ambiguous phrase, look at it in light of hundreds, if not thousands of other phrases too. And it is a mistake to go dig something up six, seven, eight years ago that hardly anybody knows about and use it to create an entire drama that explicitly contradicts very clear-cut statements that I have, alhamdulillah, been very consistent about. Now, the ambiguous phrase was, we support the political rights of the LGBT community, not the moral rights, right? And as Allah is my witness, what I intended by this was not what was understood. As Allah is my witness, I never have ever lobbied or asked Muslims to lobby for LGBT rights. It was not even my intention when I said the phrase. That's not what I intended. What was intended, and I will defend this and everybody on this platform will intend it, will, will defend it because that's the way we live, was that we're going to give them the civil rights of being a human being in this country. If they walk into our shop, we're not going to deny them service. If there are colleagues at office, right, we're not going to spit in their faces. Like we're going to give them the rights of being a fellow citizen, their political rights of doing what they're doing, even as we disagree. What is meant here is just like uh, uh, we're going to. Uh, so I had this case, but I had this actual this, this actual thing happen to me where a Muslim businessman said, you know, I have an employee who's, you know, LGBT and we give health insurance to all of our employees. Now, by law, I have to give it to his spouse as well. What am I going to do? Right. And I said, you're not responsible in the eyes of Allah. This is a generic rule. You have to give to everybody in your in your uh, you know uh, um, you know um, uh, uh, corporation. You're the CEO. You're not responsible. This is you you don't like it in your heart, but it's a generic law. You're forced to follow the law here, right? And you you are being forced to do so politically. This is what I mean. Is that you have uh, another example? A landlord, and this happens again. Uh, two two people that are married to each other of the same gender apply, and you know uh, one to be in his house legally. He cannot refuse them on that ground or else he's going to be sued. You know this. Everybody knows this. Legally, he cannot refuse them the right. If they meet the criteria in their, their bank accounts, whatever it might be, he's going to go to jail or whatever, get his license, whatever it might be. Here's the question. Does the Sharia require this person to be a martyr and stand up and say, I'm going to go to jail before I give my house to these two people? Or does the Sharia recognize that, you know what? And what are you going to do when it is the world that we live in? So what I'm trying to be pragmatic over here is that the Sharia does not require you to sacrifice your license to live in this country by being rude or crude to everybody you disagree with. And we get along with people that are worse than, you know, uh, uh, immor immorality in their sexual lives. We get along with people that are pagans, that are worshipping shaitan, devil worshippers, right? If a devil worshipper is in your office, what are you going to do? You're going to smile in his face and try your best to avoid him as much as you can, but you're going to get along with him, right? So that's what I mean. The political rights shouldn't have been phrased that way. What I mean is the right to be a part of our society. They have that right. You're not going to take that right away, Okay. Could have been okay. phrased better, but that's what I meant. By the way, I never meant to lobby and campaign for the rights of them to get married. And I've never said this and I've never even hinted at it. I have uh, uh, always a comment about this issue of uh, the moment that we say that we're against something, all of a sudden everything pivots. It pivots to we're victims and will you help us, right? We have to realize we're that framing of things, we're being played. It's a complete framing, right? Besides that, it's not, it might not even be true, right? It may be true, more true of others. But the moment that uh, some of these groups come out and the moment they feel any little tension from you, they will pivot to, look at how we're being victimized. Aren't you gonna help us? It's just a secondary way, a second wave. First wave, see if you can get your support. Second wave, get your sympathy, right? And by that, people slowly adapt to that. So 
Now, back in your time when you had that interview, I think this was all new. It's, we've been seeing this for 10 years now. As soon as you disagree, all right, let's pivot now to show you how, how, how victimized we are and do you support us not to be victimized? So now you've muddied the water or they've, because they've, you have to, you, you, you can't, nobody would say, oh, do you want us to commit suicide? Do you want us to be killed? So they find a way to soften you with that. Nobody else does this, right? It's a very smart tactic because nobody says, hey, accept Islam. No, I'm not going to accept Islam. Okay, well, Muslims are being killed, right? Do you support our right to, to stay alive? Like, nobody does da'wah like that. No other group operates like that. Maybe but try it out. Noting, maybe it worked. Huh? Maybe it'll work. Uh, maybe it'll work. Maybe you, <laughs> they had better uh, marketing uh, uh, advice. But consistently, over and over, they will elicit some sympathy out of you, right? They will elicit some sympathy out of you. And that is a technique to soften you, right? Where I'm going to say, look, hey, we're being victimized. Okay, a lot of people are being victimized. I only have 24 hours in a day. Go deal with yourselves, Okay. If that sounds harsh, that's how we all live, right? A million people are being victimized. Do I have time for this? YouTube, even Muslims, YouTube, every YouTube video, Yemen, next, Afghanistan. Um, okay, I feel sorry for you once. I'm here unwinding after dinner and they give sympathy videos, sympathy, sympathy, sympathy. Enough, I can't. No human being can do this. So just to realize that this is a strategy, observe carefully. The moment that there's one tension, there's no support, it immediately shifts to how bad we're victimized. We're about to kill ourselves. Everyone's killing us. So give us sympathy. If not support, then sympathy. Sympathy for what? Something far away from the cause, right? Oh, for my life, for my employment. Mm. So we just have to be aware that this is a repeated strategy and it's not something that, it's some, that we would have known in the past. I think all of us got played by it. But watch mm -hmm. it. It's a consistent strategy. You want right? to see a prime example of this? So on my channel, by the way, uh, I told Sheikh Yasser this, and he, he, you know, one of my earlier shows, maybe two years ago, I interviewed a transgender Hafiz. Okay? So Dr. Shadi, I don't know if you knew that or not. Like, did what? they memorize the Quran they or the Torah? It. They, they memorize the Quran. Transgender. Everything's <laughs> they, they, mem they, mem they memorize the Quran, and okay. then they transition later in life. So they memorize the Quran as a youth, right? So when I was in, and they were justifying from a Islamic point of view, using the Scott Kugel, you know, that kind of, you know, the usul of Scott Kugel, right? And then when I started pushing back a little bit, that exact thing happened. It was like, well, the average lifespan of trans men is or trans women is 24 or 25 and suicide rate this and like, and I'm like, listen, no one's saying to kill you guys. No one's saying that. I'm just saying you can't say this is like acceptable in Islam. That's just those two different things, right? But so they succeeded in getting you to defend something about them. You know, exactly. Well, right? and, and one said, because you've I've never seen a people be tiptoed around more than these people, right? right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, it's haram, but a thousand, but this, but this, but this, but this, but this, right? Yeah. Isn't this how we talk about this group, right? right? No one gets more sympathy in the entire world, more than the yeah. Palestinians, more than the Ahli Gaza, more right. than Native Americans in the past, right? Nobody says, it, it, it uh, gives more sympathy to any group. I, I say this, my sympathy, it's not free, right? And I don't feel like giving it out. That's how simple it is. I, yeah. Am I obligated by any morality or anything to go sympathizing all day long? We have right. to realize that we're um, being played. Guys, can you give me just two minutes? My father needs help downstairs. I'm coming up, okay? Nope, no, no, no problem, no problem. Um. I'll just, uh, you, by the way, the, the three, you guys are all canceled because you, you, you're now on the same platform as a transgender Hafid. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that interview that you did. I didn't did you, watch it, but you, I remember you, it was I, a Mad Mem Luke's, right? No, it was on my channel. The Mad Mem Luke's, could, th 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 that's one of the things that I like with my channel. I was like, yeah. there's probably stuff I can do that Mad Mem Luke's can't do, right? Okay. Um, but with that one, it was just like, cause back then when I started, I had this kind of like idea that like, Hey, I want to, I'll talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I need to understand where, where, where they're coming from. How's there. And so a, a friend of mine reached out to me and he's a half, he's a, he's a half, he leads a lot down in like Missouri. And he's like, I, I got, I got someone for you. Are you ready for this? And I was like, Oh yeah, sure. Um, I'll tell you, it was, um, the most drain. I had to, I had to really prepare for that interview. So I, I talked to Mobin Vade, um, and Mabin kind of helped me formulate some thoughts. He sent me some stuff. And I did an interview in person. It wasn't on Zoom. It was in person. Yeah. And um, it was like the most draining interview I've ever done. 
Yeah. Because of like you because of emotion, right? Well, you're it's all based on emotion. Exactly. You're tiptoeing yeah. too, because the thing of it is, right? A lot of us, we, there's this balance too that Sheikh Yasser mentioned in the thing is like, okay, many of us we have we have corporate jobs, you know, we've got to be able to, um, you know, keep that keep that like income flowing. We can't do something stupid based on some statement because that'll my get wife you said, canceled. Don't, come, don't do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Not because we don't believe in it, but because these people are not fair. Right. They're not just. Right. She agrees with me 100%, but these the people we're talking about, they're not fair people. Right. right? Yeah. And they're vicious. Right. When you deal with someone who's not fair, you can almost like, you should just not deal with them. Right, right. You know? Yeah. So, 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 so I think that's where it's almost like no. something that we could say is acceptable today because it's on the internet. Yeah. 10, 15 years down the road, we don't know. 10 15 minutes down the road yeah true yeah true yeah. We're, i mean I, I think we assume a level of risk right and i think sometimes we don't understand we probably haven't really thought I, I don't i i know myself i haven't really 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 thought that through right i'll tell you why is because now they're too mo too busy with the wild trump right to 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 to, to eat us up yeah if they were finished with them and they didn't have to deal with them Yep. then we'd be easy snacks for them to shut down, right? But we're not worth shutting down. We're like a politically non, uh, uh, we're politically not threatening to anybody, right? Right, right. They're still not worth shutting down. We're too small, right, right? right. of an operation. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine over Thanksgiving, a old friend of mine. He's now like a, a director at a, one of these like multinationals, consumer products companies, right? And it's a very progressive company. And I was telling him that, hey, I interviewed Richard Spencer. Yeah. And he was like, and he was, and I was like, if I worked for you guys, what would that mean? And he was like, well, it depends. It would certainly be scrutinized, right? Um, if you were buddy buddy with him the whole time and agreed with everything, you could lose your job. Yep. You push back a little bit, okay, maybe, right? But at the end of the day, that like one of the reasons I one of the things I learned from that interview was what the what people are are willing to be upset about. Yeah. Versus not upset about. So the transgender half of the interview, crickets. Okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Um, Richard Spencer, psh, you know, it, everything, you know, hit the fan, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so, so I think, it, you know, it, it, it's because, well, well, it depends on what things are being like. Like, uh, I'll give you another example. I, I was approached recently a few weeks ago, like maybe like a few weeks ago to interview uh, Avi Jorish, the Jew who went to Medina. Okay. Okay. And I was like, that would be interesting, but it's just lose lose. It's lose lose because um, I think it's a lose because number one, um, if I'm too buddy buddy with them, right? You, okay, I'm now MLI Zionist sympathizer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If I push back too hard, and this dude isn't some random like Jewish dude, he's actually like some high up. He works he works in a think tank. If I get labeled some anti semite. That has career problems with my career, et cetera. The other issues, right? So, yeah. you know, I'm like, like, what's the point of it? You know, I would be interested, but then you're kind of like, and I, I think you learn that over time because I kind of, my personal position on platforming is generally like platform until proven otherwise, mm -hmm. right? Um, you ha There has to be something, but, but that one I was like, that was kind of like a scary thing. I'm like, all right, I don't know. I just, I just don't, um, you know, you know what? 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 When I, when I go there and that, but like I actually like to get Hassan's take. Hassan, I don't. I don't think I ever talked to you about this that issue, right? Because you're someone who's, um, you know, dealt with the. We're talking about the far right earlier, and there was a the Richard Spencer interview. I, I, I don't know if you knew I actually interviewed him or not. I, that happened about a year ago. Were you? I don't know if you, did you know that. No, I, I missed it, bro. Spencer's all over the place. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, he's a different, I, I think he's, he's different probably because I recently, I think the alt right, that project was a failure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it bombed. Um, and what is the guy up to it, by the way, if I can ask, I don't, he, I don't, I don't, I don't want to derail what you're saying. He to threw some shots at me not long ago. He did? What's he up to exactly? Is he, does he have a job? Is anyone employing him? He's living in Montana and what is he that or what? Cause no, the prices he, are so cheap. He's got a spot in like he's been in between white he lives between Montana and um Virginia. Um he is trying to he's still a, a white like I would say a nationalist. 
he would say. But he was trying to clarify that his his whole thing is he was trying to explain to me like he's all about the preservation of European values. The problem is I don't think he can he can really identify what that is because okay. I'm like what you're talking about because he because I was like hey I asked him why do you th- you're a suburban kid from Dallas Texas right parents are classical Republicans right they're not alt writers you go to University of Virginia so what happens is he goes to um, Europe on a backpacking trip and he sees the Romans of Room. And he gets into Shakespeare and he sees like all these things that appeal to him about like European civilization. And he's like, he wants this, right? He wants to revive it. He's and in his words, like, I want to revive Babel. The problem is he's not religious. So the conservatives in America who are Christian aren't going to align with them. Um, you know, and he has a very specific niche niche of what he, his values are. Salam. And therefore, yeah. and um, therefore it's like, I'm like, at the end of the day, I don't see how this works because there's not enough people that actually buy into these definition of values that you that you that you that you're about, right? And he like, you know, he supported Biden in 2020 and all that stuff. So, you know, I I you know we we had a cordial conversation for sure, I would say, and people were mad about that. Um, and the ver- the idea was that he was approached to me. So I didn't go reach out to him. Somebody came to me, he's like, Richard Spencer wants to talk to a Muslim because he re- actually respects Islam and Muslims. Because they have like some stances that he agrees with, like right. So I'm like, okay, fair enough. I, and people ask me, and I was getting interrogated, like, hey, why would you play? Like, what kind of thought did you put into it? And I was like, I don't know, like ten seconds worth, <laughs> right? Look, I was you're, like, you're a podcaster, right? Yeah, right. A podcaster is a different role in the community. There's yeah. a little bit more spacious role, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, as we and Chekaster, we had we were talking about that each function in the community has a different toolkit and different set of associates that is acceptable. Right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, if I go to a guy's house, who's a physician, yep. I don't expect to go see turbans there. I expect his colleagues, right. Right. Who are whatever they are. Right. 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 Because that's his, that, so you as a podcaster, you're going to have different, uh, there's going to be some limits, right. Right. You do have to observe the shitty eye yourself as a person, sure, sure. but as someone who is a conduit, of information about other human beings. That's right. what you are. Right. You're a conduit of information about other human beings that have some relevance to your audience. Right. So I think there, you know, there's some there is some leeway. I wouldn't be so shocked, like it's a terrible thing uh, that you did. Because also, he's also insignificant now. Right. There's a big difference. It's not like he's actively hurting anybody anymore. Correct. Like, but I'm, I'm curious. Sorry, but he's irrelevant. Yeah. What's what? that? No, I said he's irrelevant. Oh, yeah. he's been let out, out out to pasture. So I have one uh, question for you, Mahin, but then I want to ask a question to check answer too. Sure. The first question, I'm just curious about the finances uh, or the economics in this country. Does a person like him like get a job? Does he work at a... Like, no. How does, he, how does he survive? So, so he is banned on YouTube. Um, he, he's not banned on Twitter. Um, you know, it, it's a, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of these guys are, they use this platform called BitChute. So a lot of their videos are on there. I don't know if he's written anything um, specifically. I, I actually don't know because in the UK there's more of a welfare culture, right? You know, yeah. like 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 I interviewed this lady named Claire Kaw, who's you know who I was wondering. She like live streams ten hours a day. I'm like, how do you? What do you do? Like, what yeah. job pays that? And you only have nine hundred followers on YouTube. Like, you yeah. don't have enough. The algorithm. You're not gonna get paid by YouTube. Mashallah, I see Sheikh Yasser's YouTube award in the back. By the way. <laughs> Your plaque kind of stood out to me. I was like, what is that for one million? I wish, bro. <laughs> oh no, it's uh, one zero less than a million. Okay, okay. I came gotcha. up last year. Okay, okay. Inshallah, make dua inshallah one day. Hopefully. Inshallah, inshallah. So, you know, I I I actually don't know. That's a really good question. Um, within our community, the people who I I, I have a hypothesis, and I'm I'm not gonna say them and I told people, I've told people in the inner circle this. That some of these people who were spending all their time, they, they can do a live stream at like 2 p.m. on a weekday for four hours, which is kind of what I did today, but I work from home today only, right? I'm normally in the office. But people who are doing live streams all the time, 11 a.m., 2 p.m., multiple times a week, right? You look at their Patreon, you're like kind of, I don't know. Some of them, I think, are being paid off by feds. I'll be mm. up front. I think some because if you not think the, about not the nothing but facts live stream, I can assure you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but I think but, the day. <laughs> right, but but I think that yeah. like 
if you think about the, you know, this whole idea of Sheik Yasser talks about like these people, their agenda, if, if you've seen all they're known for is causing division and attacking scholars and tearing down the establishment of scholarship, right? Who's best, who's invested in that? Mm. You know what well, I mean? Who was that Islamophobe that paid uh, uh, some mold to enter care for $100,000? Like, yep. who was that? Um, Emerson. 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 Yeah. yeah. You know what I thought, Yaqi? Here's this guy, Emerson Aduwaladud, Yani Shaytan. And he's spending massive amounts of money to infiltrate care and to get some dirt and whatnot. And here we have somebody who says to be in our camp doing far more effective, you know what I'm saying, in, 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 in bad mouthing and what. And you know what? Again, Hassan, I say this to you honestly, you know, I, I, I love the founders of care, the founder of care, they're doing great work, but I'm also a critic internally. I don't like a lot of what they do. But at the end of the day, there is no other organization, right, that is doing what they're doing. So to take that organization as being symptomatic of the worst of the worst, demonizing them, who really benefits in the long run? When you create this amount of distrust, I mean, if you look at the agenda of some of these people, essentially mainstream Islam is lost. The largest organizations are the most corrupt. The most effective preachers are the worst because they're, they have a hidden agenda, according to this, mm -hmm. you know, Buhtan and Azim. My, my agenda is very clear. It's the preservation of Islam in the next generation. That's the agenda. We want to preserve this deen of Allah. And in order to do that, we have new challenges. We're going to have to rethink through them. It's always been my agenda. But the, the, the doubts that are being sowed are frankly almost destructive of mainstream faith. Who wins in the end of the day? Anyway, so these are these are difficult questions. I'll well, hey, so, 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 so uh, brothers, uh, we have about 15 minutes before Dr. Shadi has to go. Uh, Hassan and Sheikh Yasser are going to stay on for a little side segment at the very end. But is there anything that you want to cover on this political engagement topic that we didn't like? Yeah, uh, uh, this is related to it. Sure, go right. ahead. And that's the question I said I wanted to bring up and, and sh to see Sheikh Yasser's opinion, also Hassan's opinion, and your opinion. Sure. We know that in Islam, like excess, anger, harshness, we always speak against these things, right? Yep. Rahma, we promote mercy, sympathy, empathy. We promote these things. But I'm seeing a madkhal, an entrance of shaitan, through people, through sympathy, misplaced sympathy, right? And that's something that we need to bring up as a religious discourse, as a religious issue. You Sympathy to a certain uh, groups or to certain things is haram, or it's something that, I don't know if you say haram because it's an emotion, but it's, it's misguided. And it's a type of way to actually lure people into something that it's a gateway into accepting something else. I think we have to put more light on that and shed more light on that. And this may be why the Prophet said and warned that the Dajjal's biggest followers will be women, right? Why? Because he uses sympathy, right? He take you the most misguided person, the most misguided, and make them an object of victimhood and, and sympathy. Mm. And that Dr. softens Hadi, everyone too. No that. doubt. What you said is 100% accurate. Nobody can disagree. But as usual, the devil is in the details, right? What is misplaced sympathy? Who's going to define misplaced sympathy? Mm -hmm. That's where the, the, the controversy is going to come. And as for me, I have been very clear when it comes to uh, uh, this issue of LGBT. If a person desires to live in accordance with the Sharia, even if they fall short, they have my utmost sympathy. Utmost 100%. sympathy. Yeah. And if a person uh, flouts the Sharia, justifies, right, has no concern or care, then they've lost my sympathy. Sure. Unfortunately, even this is problematic for a lot of people, right? Because they want to demonize even a sinner. Mm -hmm. They want to say that you should have no sympathy for the sinner in this case. And I strongly disagree, especially given the environment we live in where our youth are being supported to go down this path. If yeah. we're going to block the doors of sympathy and of rahmah to them, and if we're going to shut off any hope of, subhanAllah, maybe in different societies, harshness would have played the trick to bring them back to the truth. But in this society that we live in, as long as they wish to live in accordance to the sharia, then the doors of the masjid shall remain open to them. They're not trying to normalize. They're not flouting. 
it's their personal sin that you happen to know about because of you know whatever they've come to you or their friends have come to whatever it might be they have the utmost sympathy no, and I, 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 I totally agree but the so general, then what's the issue what's the, so then what's the, the issue of contention the broader so lobby agreements here so what's yeah, the issue we agree with that the, the okay. it's the broader lobby of the zionists use this sympathy is the number one arrow okay look at us we've been victimized so they want to soften you okay we're not talking points anymore we're talking emotions this other group with transgender lobby lgbt lobby they use the same arrow they use the same tactic to soften a person up to you by saying, look at how much, okay, you're not agreeing with this, but look at how much we're being killed. Look at how much we're suffering. Look at how much they're committing suicide. I think of committing suicide for other reasons, right? Look at how much this, that, and the other, right? So it's almost the, the emotional frame in context, vibration that you're in when you're dealing with these people is they're so miskeen and we're the harsh ones. We have to be aware of this. That's planned. So, Dr. Shadi, may I ask you, is there any mainstream da'i, sheikh, alim, talib al-ilm that is preaching this type of stuff? No, all of us, everyone who speaks. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. The mo- yeah, but the, the, every one of us, and I, just an observation, the moment we have to make a statement about this group of people, it must be prefaced and couched and tiptoed with so much sympathy and care and love, right? So, that's the point that it's i'm just making an observation not an accusation that this is a planned strategy agreed let me also make an observation let us also not fall prey to the counter reaction yeah which we see amongst the shabab Mm -hmm. which is any emotion that perhaps might give a modicum of sympathy is perceived as pro lgbt yeah. Or in fact, yeah. being compassionate itself has become a slur. Unbelievable to me that the mm-hmm. deen of Rahma and the prophet of Rahma and the book of Rahma has become a slur when you're a compassionate imam. Unbelievable to me. So we also have to be careful of the counter reaction, right? Yeah. Where, again, it's this notion of an easy target. You mm-hmm. can't blame the country you live in. So you blame your sheikh. You blame mm-hmm. a politician even though that person is nowhere near the amount of influence on your kids, like I'm saying. So we also have to be careful, Dr. Shadi, of the opposite, which is the counter reaction of being fair in this regard and understanding the world has changed. And this lifestyle is being normalized, which it wasn't 50 years ago. Hence, when our Shabab faced the option of being embraced by that crowd, being celebrated, being put on a pedestal. Yeah. We're going to have to lower the rhetoric of 50 years ago. Yeah. We're going to have to. And this is in the masalih of the deen. And this is what the religion dictates. We cannot speak like our grandfathers did. I'm not criticizing how they did. It was a different time and place. And we're going to have to couch that language with some sympathy that maybe they didn't have 50 years ago. Yeah. And, and by the way, this is a generational thing. There is an entire generation that comes in. If you're not in the vibration of sympathy for them, they think you're the devil, right? And it's not just Qom Lut. It's entire generation that you can't talk to them. They're so yeah. fragile. fragile. And it's almost like my heart is tired of sympathy. Well, yeah, like, this this it's woke like, culture is going to self-implode. Sympathy. This woke culture, yeah. of, this cancel culture will self-implode because they will yeah. start canceling each other after a while. No, it's only yeah. a matter of time. Yeah. And mm. in my uh, humble opinion, their own trajectory shall be their downfall. Yeah. All we have to do is remain consistent upon mm-hmm. our ideals. All we have to do is to continue to preach the truth. This movement cannot last because yeah. it is an affront not only to Allah and his messenger and the sharia, it is an affront to how Allah created the creation, the core of the creation, right? It You cannot sustain a civilization that doesn't believe in gender. It's not going to work. Yeah. It's only a matter of time. We just you have know, to it. be consistent in our preaching. Hassan, you, you want to say something, Hassan? Well, I just want to say in a practical perspective, you know, I, I've met two types of Muslims, you know, the, the, uh, that, that are struggling with these issues in particular. There are Muslims that they have struggles with, uh, the, uh, towards certain, certain temptations that we are completely against. And yet they're humble and they love and they respect the deen. They keep it private. And you actually can be sympathetic to bring them in. 
to do mujahada of the nafs, to take pride in the Quran and the Sunnah and grow. And honestly, they can be the best of people. And then there's the others, which themselves may not even be engaging in that, but they want to be overly welcoming and overly liberal in that approach. And then we think, and I've been in those shoes where I try to, okay, man, I want to pull in these young liberal activist Muslims. I want to make them feel welcome. I don't want to scare them off as this bearded Muslim guy. And unfortunately for those who take their activism as their dean, for some of them, you, you really cannot win them over. And eventually you got to just cut losses. And I feel that is the most dangerous group. It isn't even the non-Muslims that are like that. It, it isn't even the Muslims that may have their own personal sins and you can win them over and, and support them and they need our support. It's, it's those who take their activism as their dean while claiming to be Muslim. And uh, it's it's very dangerous. Wallahu mustan. Sure. Back to the sympathy thing. So, Dr. Sh we were talking earlier about the whole transgender. I've had the interview. Yeah. In that interview, I remember, um, because I, I, I'm, of the I'm of the opinion that people don't want to have those feelings, right? You Sometimes you don't have control over it. If we're heterosexual, we know we're attracted to women when we hit a certain age, right? At the same time, I don't, it, it doesn't, like, I'm not of the, Point that you just completely every there has to be a reason you might i remember i was having a conversation with um shake jesse mckenzie you know y'all know i don't know if y'all shake jesse mckenzie several like a decade ago very well he, yeah, i know him before you know before he went to Medina, yeah. yeah he's got like eight kids or something right and i don't remember we were having talk about like he told me something before i had kids like maheen the thing about it is you can do all you want you really don't have control at the end of the day you don't have control right true and, and so when i was speaking to um this, this 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 individual on my podcast and he's telling me about madrasa and going hips and like trying to be in the dean and then when he starts realizing same-sex attraction i actually felt like yeah we kind of screwed up because we didn't have the infrastructure in place because he was trying to work through it originally he, this, this, so this individual is a, is a is a man who transitioned to a woman okay um you said sheikh jason mckenzie sheikh ja no not sheikh jassy the Transition. I'm I'm talking about I'm I'm, I'm, I'm okay. talking about I'm talking about like Sheikh Jassy gave me this advice that we don't have control because sometimes oh. a lot of a lot of the brothers we talk to they think that they ch people choose to be gay, and I'm like not necessarily. Sometimes you have those desires kick in somehow. We don't know. I don't know how, but like there, some people aren't choosing that right. And I, I think, think there is there is there is some studies coming out, and, and I think we should save this for the experts on that. But that it yeah. is heavily culturally influenced by what's normalized, okay, and, and it isn't genetic and, and scientific as, as okay. they try to make it, you know. Okay. So, you know, I think that's an interesting thing, but that goes more to what Shadi. I mean, I really respect a lot of what Shadi said, as well as what Sheikh Yasser. I think from a practical perspective, sorry to jump in, I'll, I'll see sure. the floor in a second. Sure. Look, from a practical perspective, I can and have taken the positions Sheikh Yasser has when it comes to engagement and even how we say things. I mean, I was in Orlando around the Pulse shooting, so I literally drove to the hospital and supported the families there on the ground, and I absolutely condemned what happened and, and stood in solidarity against violence. I mean, who wouldn't, right? right? And, and I and I stand by that, and I think we did it in a balanced way. I stand by my statements. However, I, I think now it is time after 10, 20 years of seeing what's happening that we understand the vibes uh, Sheikh Shadi's talking about and the long-term implications of just constantly having to talk about sympathy. And maybe it's time we start shifting. And this country can shift, uh, uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade as a great example, but also that so many Muslims have drank the Kool-Aid so much that they're tiptoeing around that and, they, and they're outraged about that. And it has been Allah and Amal Wakil. But we have to learn and we have to adapt. We have to change. We have to give room for that. And we have to pull each other up and advise and, and have it be based in love and brotherhood, not in, in some of the ways we're seeing it happening. Before we know, let, let me just uh, let me just also comment on this Roe versus Wade thing. Honestly, it was not surprising because we know this, but it is distressing to see the default of the next generation is basically pro-liberal, pro, you know, um, uh, uh, jumping on the bandwagon of, uh, the progressive right, uh, the progressive left, excuse me. And uh, obviously, the people of knowledge, all of us are very concerned at this. It's not the right way to go. But the fact of the matter is most of our audience that listens to us is not on that. And there are segments of our audience that as a reaction to the progressive left have jumped on the far right. And that's why sometimes people like myself seem to be a little bit more harsh on the far right within our ranks, partly because, primarily because we know they're listening to us. 
the progressive left doesn't really listen to us. They've already marked me as a fundamentalist, as a, you know, um, hardcore fanatic, as a anti this and that. They don't listen to us. They really don't. The, the mainstream bulk of the American Muslim community does not respect traditional scholarship of any stripe. We all know that, right? It's frustrating, but it is what it is. So sometimes when we're a little bit more harsh at the, the, the far right within our ranks, it's simply because we know that our message is actually being listened to by them. Not because we think they're a bigger threat. No, I say this bluntly. The biggest threat is indeed liberalism. The biggest threat is indeed radical feminism. It is this complete reorientation of sexuality and gender. And I'll say this publicly and I've said it in the khutbahs. But when I'm speaking on these types of podcasts and Facebook and social media, when I do bring up the other side, it's because I know my words are actually reaching them. And I hope that's clear. They are not the bigger threat. It's a nuisance at best. Wallahi, it's a nuisance that is irritating. It's kind of eating inside the ummah, but it's not going to destroy the ummah. You know what I'm saying? It's been there, done that. We've seen this extremism since the days of the Khawarij and the Madkharis. It's another phase. Unfortunately, many of the youth caught up in this phase, many of them, history shows us, will lose their spirituality because they jumped onto a version of the faith that is too hardcore. And they can only have it in their MSA bubbles. They can only have it in their parents' basements. They cannot have it in corporate America. They mm -hmm. cannot have it when they have a wife and teenage daughters at home, right? And so one of two things will happen. Small percentage will mellow out and join the mainstream. And that's when the apologies come in. Sheikh Yasser, we're so sorry, this and that, you know? And the majority of them, they just fizzle out. And they stop being religious because the level of religiosity that they thought was the real deal is not, and it is impractical, and it is not the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence why we are preaching out to that, that group, because we hope to save the most of them and to keep on reminding them that follow the senior ulama, not me, I'm still mid-age, follow those bigger than me, follow those with fully white beards and whatnot, and who have wisdom, who have training in this, and it's not just book knowledge, you know, I've said it publicly, and I'll say it again, right now as we stand, you know, Imam Zaid Shaka to me is the sheikh of American Muslims. You know, he is the person I look up to the most when it comes to, not because he has the most book knowledge. We all know with utmost love and respect, he doesn't. But what he has, none of us have. And that's wisdom of being a part of this land. What it means to be a part and parcel, having gone through the struggles that none of us could have gone through. Why don't you look up to him and go to him for this practical advice? Imam Siraj Wahaj, go to him. He's been in the trenches. He's been here. Jamal Badawi, founder of MSA and Isna, go to him, right? These are our leaders, even if they don't have the type of book knowledge that some of up upstarts of the Madrasas and Jamas Namis and Azhars have. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for book knowledge. Frankly, sometimes book knowledge, a little bit of it is more dangerous than a bit of worldly wisdom. So my humble pushback to these purists i know you're coming from a place of sincerity i know you feel betrayed when people like myself and others don't use the type of language you'd like to hear right fine dismiss us but then go to those senior to us go to those whom i call up when i'm in trouble don't know what to do which position to take i'll call up imam zaid i'll call up these people and say Sheikh, what do you think i should do why don't you go to them they have track records longer than our own but whatever you do don't go to somebody whose only credibility is causing fitna online just don't go to that type of crowd because honestly, it's just going to be destructive to your own spirituality in the long run. Wallahu alam. Dr. Shadi, I know you got to run. Do you have any closing thoughts before you head out of here? Uh, alhamdulillah, this was a good episode and uh, I only had one closing thought that oftentimes if you face an enemy, right, you become more sympathetic to your enemy's enemy. So a lot of guys who are on the coasts and I've noticed this, they actually swing the other way. They see the damage of the woke left and they may their sympathies will go to the right or right leaning, right? Guys in the South who grew up in Islam, they may have seen the, the, the evils of the right. Like they may have tasted some of that racism that the right has. So they may have, a, so I think it's really good to have that perspective, right? Because that would explain why you know, they, they like put a wall between them and the right and others are almost like very close with the right. Others have a wall with the left and others are close with the left. Right. Like we're talking within the per acceptable parameter, but having a leaning, right. A leaning. So a lot of it's based on experience. Right. So that's just an observation that I'm making. It, 
doesn't have to be right, but it's just my observation uh, on things. I may have, it might be limited, but um, that's all that extra thing that I had to add. Otherwise, thank you all very much. Jazakallah Khair for joining us today. Um, I, I, uh, let, me, let me just say one thing with Dr. Shadi online before I have to leave. SubhanAllah, yeah. I want everybody to know, Dr. Shadi and I, frankly, we know this, we hardly see eye to eye about so many issues. Yet, yeah. I know I speak for the both of us when I say there's genuine love and respect, compassion and concern, genuine making dua for the other and wanting to see you flourish. Right. Yet we disagree about everything. Almost. I mean, you get my point, right? Whenever yeah. we're together, it's always, and this is what I'm trying to, 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 to impart to the people that are listening. You don't have to see eye to eye to, to understand the other person is sincere, loves Allah and his messenger, wants the khair for the ummah. That's, the, that's my goal. It's not really about politics or what, no. It's about bringing a sense of who is really on our team? The one on our team, you know them by the fact that they want what is best for the ummah. They want to please Allah and they're trying to follow the sunnah of the messenger of Allah. When a person is of that paradigm, even if they end up going a slightly different path, still you're within the same family and you love each other like the same family. You don't take them as an enemy simply because you don't see eye to eye on some tertiary issue. That's the point I want to say publicly so that people know this, that usually when Dr. Shadi and myself come together, It'll end up in not a heated debate. It's always a loving conversation, right? About how we disagree about something. Isn't that the case, Dr. Shadi? Right. That, that is the case. And and some of these brothers too that are even uh, are, are even here with me in, in the studio. Uh, they said, "Well, what's this going to be about?" I said, "Firstly, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, you will not find somebody more sincere to the general community, right? And his preaching clips are perfect." Right. I love the, the preaching clips. Even my daughter and my, my son said they come back and my son was upset he couldn't even come today. Right. Uh, son, to, all to, to this, right? And so uh, and I said that uh, uh, his sincerity to the ummah and ease to deal with and ikhlas in when he deals with people. Right. Is why at any time I'm going to go and have a meeting with him. Right. At any time. So it's reciprocated on our side. Jazakallah. Khair. Uh, Jazakallah, Dr. Shadi. Well, yeah, cool. This, this yeah, warms this, yeah. mashallah, this warms my heart. So, uh, uh, we'll we'll talk soon, Dr. Shadi, and then we'll, we'll uh, close it off with Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Yasser and Sidi Hassan for the for the oh. remaining part of it. Okay, Jazakallah, okay, brothers. Take yeah, care. Yeah, Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam So, um, Sidi Hassan and Sheikh Yasser, do you have anything else on on this topic before I segue into? Uh, I think a more Imaniyat segue based on Hassan's experience. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I love I love Sheikh Yasser's uh, closing remarks uh, uh, that we need that brother, uh, right. we need that brotherhood and that love and, and how we approach and how we move forward. Sure. Uh, also, just very quickly on the political side, uh, in terms of uh, what Sheikh Shadi said, I mean, I think some great advice is now is the time for the American Muslim community to step back also. And this is a secondary issue. I think the primary issue is how we interact with each other. But on a secondary issue, now is the time to step back actually from entanglement with the with the left. Uh, I think we've done it yep. far too heavy, far too deep. And now's the time to pull out because I, even the liberals are not happy with each other. You know what I'm yeah, saying? I, mean, I, mean, I don't think Democrats are going to. 2020, you know, exactly. 10 years ago, the world was very different. And if exactly. some of us made certain decisions at that time, sure. frankly, I don't know if I changed those decisions back in the moment, right? Sure, but, but for now. Think, yes, context is everything. It, and now we've seen the dangers, you know, Alhamdulillah, Islamophobia is much better now, I mean, meaning much less than it mm. was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, alhamdulillah, things have changed. And so we can weigh the masalih and mafasid all over again. And if things happen in another 10 years, we'll do that again. It's the mm -hmm. principle. And the application can vary from person to time, to context, to place. And even if we disagree on the application, as long as the principle is followed, we cannot take the other person as an enemy. That was really the whole khulasa. Uh, I guess one final comment from me before we segue to the other topic. These types of conversations need to happen in every community not just online. Every community needs to bring its political activists and its clergy and have a frank dialogue, open house, right? And the people need to hear because that's the only way the bar of tolerance is going to be raised. We have a huge divide between the political activists and between the clergy. I'm not going to mention any names here. I've been invited to a very, very uh, major uh, a conference of global activists of the Muslim community, the exact same weekend, there is a very major conference of ulama taking place in another city. I've been speak, I'll go, I'm going to be speaking at the both of these conferences. The two are unaware of each other's presence even. They don't even know that there's this other conference taking place. Both of these, by the way, are national. Everybody, you know, 
And yet there's not a single person attending both as far as I know except me. Subhanallah. Yani, what type of divide is this? That all of our activists and they're all doing things for the sake of, you know, the global ummah in their own way. And all of our ulama and they're all doing things that we're used to and accustomed to. And they're not even aware of each other's existence, much less communication. I think that's a major problem. And we demonize the other, stereotype the other, right? The, the religious clergy dismiss the activists as being completely religiously incompetent, religiously insincere. And that is not the case. It's a very big stereotype. Many amongst them love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They actually pray. Hassan knows this himself when you met them, you know. They pray on the hill, you know. Even if they don't pray five times a day, they recognize some of them. They recognize they should and they try to squeeze it. And I've met people working on the hill, you know, and, and whatnot. And they tell me that they go into the rooms in the Pentagon and whatnot and make sure they pray regularly five times a day. So they're doing what they're doing, thinking that it's for the khair. And we have on the other side, ulama, we need to bridge the gap have conversations amongst each other so that we understand the paradigm and not take enemies of those who genuinely desire good for the ummah of the Prophet So, So, Sidi Hassan, real quick, um, in, in if we are going to break from the left, I think the trap we have to avoid then is like not do the same thing with the right. So that I was actually going to say that. I was just going <laughs> to jump in and say, I want to put a disclaimer one. I say yeah. break from the left. It yeah. does not mean we commit to the right. Again, we have to remain our independence and we can support on a case by case. And guess what? That's going to require political ijtihad again. And, and we're going to have to make tough decisions. Some will be right. Some will be wrong. We will learn. But that spirit of loving each other and 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 wanting good from each other. And that's really sort of the point I want to I want to hit home, uh, uh, jumping off of what Sheikh Yasser said, which is I believe that the excitement and the potential within our community is from our ability to synergize between the scholars, the activists, the speakers, the community servants, the philanthropists, the businessmen. Our community right now is still absolutely lacking in those strong networks. We have a lot of work to go to bring people together, joining the scholar with the businessman, with the philanthropist, with the activist, with the scholar, that we all work together for a common goal. And ultimately, we have to remember the Prophet said it best, of course, Adinu Nasiha. What is Nasiha? Wishing well for each other. And I will tell you, a lot of times we don't have that wishing well. We don't like somebody. We're competing with them politically, legally, scholarly. We, we want to see them fall. We want to see them taken down. We want to tear them down. We want to get our claim to fame by attacking them. It's it, There's no nasiha. There's no like, man, even if he did wrong, I'm sad he did wrong. Like, I wish he did right. Let me call him. Let me talk to him. Let me engage with him. We got to pull together. May we have those hearts that seek I mean, unity on haq. Not unity on battle, but unity on haq, driven by love. I mean, I mean and with that... Yeah, but but like one of the things I with my channel, the one thing that I'm really trying to focus on going forward is I want my audience and I'm really speaking to Muslim men here in the United States as my I think as I think when I reflect upon my primary audience, these are people that are listening that this that I want to get this message to. Right. I think when it comes to politics in an ideal world, I think people should study the political issues. They should know. There's going to be things that resonate with them. Dr. Shadi mentioned depending on region. There's th certain things that you might res within the sphere of acceptability. You might be right leaning or left leaning. There's certain things you. If we have people in both camps and understanding issues, even at a grassroots level, like locally, I think what happens is like we get caught up into federal stuff. Local elections, there's just too much noise, right? They're, but they're important, right? So part of it is to ed get educated on the basis of economics and political theory and how the system works. Right. And you're going to have things you as a person gravitate towards, which are going to be left leaning and right leaning or ver vice versa. Right. And I think we have to be comfortable with e each other along that sphere. Understand there's going to be people in both camps if we do that naturally. Right. So that way and we operate. But again, it comes back to what you said. The paradigm is still Islam and everything else fits under that. Right. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب